we are we are set to go. I'm going to go ahead and get started with the uh, while people dial in. Uh, so welcome everybody to the Measuring Network Quality for End Users Workshop, uh, an IEB workshop in virtual 2021. Uh, thank you for all coming for regardless of whatever time zone you're in. Uh, this is day one. You probably guessed that already. Um, so the structure of the workshop I'll go over really briefly, which is we have a three-day workshop scheduled over the next three days. It's four hours per day. Um, we have roughly hour-long sort of sub-sessions the way that uh, the chairs in the program committee divided things up. So we have hour-long sub-sessions with uh, discussion time in each of them. So there's uh, five, there's an, a small number of five-minute presentations, three to four typically, and uh, we will, they're very, very rapid, and the whole point of them is to just get your succinct points across to see the discussion times that happen later. And there will be three minutes or so of clarification questions after each presentation, uh, but please no discussion during that time. Uh, there should really just be time for, you know, I didn't understand something about your slides or can you further elaborate on something? Um, but the, the real meat will be in the discussions, which we have set for 30 to 40 minutes after the presentation sets. Uh, because we have a huge number of participants, um, we are we have decided to try and limit people's dis uh, comment time, the microphone lines, to 60 seconds, uh, which we recognize is both short and long, depending on how much you like to talk. Um, but we encourage you know all workshop participants to actively participate in these discussions. You can see that the word discussion is in bold like four times on this slide. Uh, you probably get the point that that we're, that's what we're really shooting for, right? That this should be a interactive collaboration type environment. Uh, the session chairs will be strictly enforcing uh, all the times. Um, they, we have uh, a number of session chairs that we've picked out of the program committee that have volunteered to, um, to run each set of panels, basically. A little bit of administrative. Uh, this workshop is being recorded, supposedly. It's automatic. Oh, yep, it's recording. Um, and we will publish the results to YouTube sometime after the event is over, uh, working with um, the IUTF Secretariat to make that happen. Um, and then the other thing that we've decided to do is we will close the recording at the end of the workshop every day, but uh, we will leave the room open for a few hours uh, in, in case people want to stay around, maybe have some smaller group conversations um, and, you know, feel free to, to say during discussion time, hey, let's continue this, uh, you know, after the day is over, if you want more of an informal um, discussion and people can hang around and uh, maybe brainstorm and follow on. So we'll try and do that every day. Um, it'll stay open for a couple of hours, um, but the recording will be turned off. Um, I want to thank everybody attending today. The IEB, you know, really appreciates the energy that has been put into this workshop. Um, so on behalf of the IEB, uh, you know, thank you very much, especially to uh, the workshop chairs, Jenny and, and Omer. Um, they uh, put an immense amount of work. It's very difficult to put together such a rapid paced, you know, workshop with so many participants. And we couldn't have done it without the program committee, which uh, there's a large number of people that helped review all of the, the documents, uh, put them into you know, keywords and grouping so that we could hopefully put together a pres presentation a series that will work really, really well. Um, but even more importantly, right, all of you that have contributed documents and uh, have offered to you know, present, I'm sorry that we couldn't have every document author be a, a present. Um, but, but you know, the, obviously that this is a topic which is highly uh, engaging and we're really looking forward to this, the discussions that we get out of it. Um, so thank you very much to everybody that, that helped um, and that for those that are showing up today to actively participate in the discussions. Um, the agenda, uh, I, I think, is on the website. This is today's agenda. Um, so there's a lot of you know, packed time. We'll spend the first hour, we'll go into our first uh, presentations, or three presentations, as well as a half an hour discussion time. Uh, there will be a keynote in, in an hour by Vince Cerf, and I'll introduce him at that time. And then we'll have a couple more uh, short presentations directly thereafter. Uh, there will be some time to ask Vint uh, any uh, clarifying questions or um, you know, discussions based on him. So he'll probably give about a 20 minute presentation and then we'll have 10 minutes of discussion you know, around his particular presentation. I'm um, greatly looking forward to that. And then we will have a short break in the middle of every day. So there's a two hour you know, slot or really an hour and 50 minutes and then we'll have a or two hour slot and then we'll have a, a 10 minute break every day. And then we'll get into furthering into introductions and then we'll begin sort of some of the meat of our, our discussions later in the day, which is sort of the metrics, uh, the first metric session. 
So that is it. I'm going to turn it over now to Keith with four minutes to spare. So we're, we're beyond on track, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, Keith, are you here and available? Hello, be. I'm here. Excellent. Uh, do you want to share your slides? Yeah, let me do that. The chairs will be, uh, the session chairs will be sh sharing all the slides to uh, decrease the amount of time between switching pe between uh, presenters with the short presentations. So. Okay, how does that look for you? Uh, looks good. Okay, great. Well, our first speaker will be the uh, person who literally his work got me interested in this field. Uh, without further ado, Stuart Cheshire, the internet is a shared network. Thank you, Keith. Um, uh, welcome to this workshop. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, let's move to the first slide. Today's common internet speed tests are like counting cars passing on the freeway. You can add more lanes and the freeway can move more cars per minute. But that doesn't mean necessarily that any individual car is getting to its destination any faster. You've made the freeway wider, not faster. That's why we call it bandwidth, not band speed. And that's great. Now that we know how to provide abundant bandwidth, what should we focus on next? And my focus is responsiveness. But there are many things we should look at for improving network quality. I've listed some items here for things that internet connections could do better. Uh, IPv6 support is one obvious example, uh, reducing the need for NAT and giving devices addresses that make them reachable. And innovation, uh, new protocols. Uh, Multipath TCP and QUIC give better mobility by supporting multiple parallel communication paths. Things like TCP fast open, TLS 1.3, give us faster connection setup. And most of the time here, we're not looking for network operators to do any work. We're mainly looking at them to not block new protocols that are being developed. Uh, all of these are important, but my current focus is the next elephant in the room after we've provided abundant bandwidth. And we should continue to work on yet more bandwidth. But in parallel, we should ask the question, why don't we get consistently good responsiveness on our networks that are so fast? So let's move on. I want to take a moment to look at the choice of words here, as well as moving bigger objects through the network, we should try to move them through the network faster. And that means getting a request to a server and getting the response back quicker. So lower round trip time. But I particularly care about end to end delays, not just the network ping time measured using ICMP echo request, because that's not what we spend our days doing on our computers when we use the network. So I want us to keep our focus on what's important for end users. And that's what people sometimes call glass to glass or speaker to speaker round trip time. If we're talking and you ask me a question and I hear you and I respond, the important question is how long does it take for you to hear my reply? Where we find delays in the network, we should fix those. And that's what the ITF works on. But where we find delays in end systems as well, in microphones, in cameras, encoding delays, display delays, we should work on fixing those too. So my goal is not to scapegoat the network and blame everything on the network. My goal is to get better end user experience. And I also care about consistency. People often quote average round trip time, but the good average by itself may not be enough. 
if for five seconds out of a typical minute, the delay is briefly 10 times worse, then that doesn't help. That would make for a very rough video conferencing experience. So I care more about the 99th or the 99.9th percentile. So what is the responsiveness that applications can expect to get almost all of the time? Uh, next slide, please. So now I'll get on to the subject of my draft, my submission, uh, which will I plan to submit as an internet draft. A lot of the problems in today's internet that make it unable to consistently deliver good responsiveness are because we built a shared packet switch network, but we didn't work out very well how to share it. That's what I'd like us to fix. I believe that all flows in the network should be capacity seeking. If there's more capacity available, I want my video conference to give better video and audio quality. But if there's less capacity available, I don't want it to just fail. I want it to adapt. I believe that all flows in the network deserve to get both high throughput and low delay at the same time. Key techniques here, key technologies are active queue management to keep queue short, explicit congestion notification to signal senders to adjust their rate without the cost of packet loss. I would love to see fine grained notification like L4S become successful because that lets us keep queues even shorter. I have my reservations about flow queuing. Flow queuing assumes that we want to protect a well-behaved flow from a badly behaved flow. And there are cases where that may be useful. But if we believe that all flows are capacity seeking, if they use a Reno style congestion control algorithm, they will fill up their queue until either packet loss or ECN pushes back. If but if you had about me. if you had about twenty seconds on this topic, what would you say? Um, uh, well, that's what I'm trying to do, and and I'm 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 trying to keep on time because we have a lot of presentations to get through, and as the first one, I w I want to set a a good precedent for the rest of the workshop. Um, so I want not just a flow to be insulated from other flows. I want it to be insulated from the effects of its own capacity seeking behavior. And my final point is that it's not a zero sum game. Uh, bandwidth is a zero sum game. If you take some away from one client to give to another, then one client loses so another client can win. But delay management is not a zero sum game. We can give low delay for everything and all current speed tests in the internet are not measuring this and uh, telling people something that doesn't matter anymore. It reminds me of uh, teenage boys in the 1990s would brag about whose computer had the most megahertz. They even had little LED, LED displays on the front showing the clock speed and a turbo boost button you could press to make it go faster. Nobody cares anymore. How many megahertz does your iPhone have? Nobody cares. They care about what it can do, not the specs. So let's move to the last slide. I think we're, we're really out of time. If you could uh, sum up quickly, thank you. Well, I'm sorry, on the timetable, it said I had five minutes. Um, I hear it about eight now, Stuart. Okay. Well, I'll, um, in my document, I mentioned some other things which I won't talk about now, but in the spirit of SIGCOM, uh, outrageous opinions, I have severe reservations about non q building flows as a concept, and UDP is not a transport protocol. So if you're using that and you don't understand that, we should be worried about the damage you're going to do to the internet. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Are there any clarifying questions before we move on?
Okay, I'm sure we'll have Thank more you. discussion about this, but seeing none, let's move on to another friend of mine, John Iyengar. John, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me, Keith? I can hear you. Wonderful. All right, get started. Um, so thank you for inviting me to give a talk uh, on this. I am uh, Jana Ingar, and I'm going to start off with next slide, please. Uh, talking about the workshop itself, broadly, when I saw this call for papers, um, I was first very intrigued and, and obviously excited, as all of you must have been. Um, and I saw the questions that were described in the in the in the workshop uh, call for papers, saying, "What are the fundamental properties of a network that contribute to good user experience, and so on?" And, and all worthy questions, of course. And my first response was, um, "Next slide." That this sounds like a program to find some abstract metrics for general internet quality. And my immediate instinctive response was, "Next slide." This is doomed to be eventually useless. And then I thought some more, and, and, and I've, I've had this thought in my mind for a little while, next slide, that there will never be any Maxwell's equations for internet quality. I've thought about this, and I wanted to say this loud to many people, uh, uh, that there are no fundamental laws of the internet, so to speak, and we'll never be able to find them, and any program to look for them is doomed. And as I thought about this more and more, next slide, please, I wanted to bring my inner Lewis Black out. For those of you who aren't familiar, Louis Black is a comedian who's known for his angry rants. So uh, basically your average IETFR at an IAB open mic. Um, and I decided to write something that would express that. Next slide, please. And I started to write and saying that talking about metrics in the abstract is meaningless. I'm gonna go through this in not so much a Louis Black voice, but an Indian Louis Black voice, cause that's the best I can do. Um, that application metrics are ultimately what matter specific applications and their metrics that ultimately de uh, drive deployment of anything in a network. Look at a whole bunch of examples, ECN, AQM, congestion control. All of these were demonstrably great in some, uh, some uh, uh, abstract metric, but didn't move the needle for real applications. Next, please. And the best example of this is really congestion control. The community went through many phases of trying to figure out how to evaluate congestion controllers by, by trying to distill uh, internet topologies, by trying to figure out what internet traffic looks like, and then with just TCP and applications, then finally giving up and coming to terms now more recently to, to actually thinking about what congestion control really does to real applications. Next, please. So I'll propose shortcutting the whole thing and not go looking for abstract metrics because you can't really do very much with this. I, uh, I, would, I would propose that you look at, uh, uh, net, uh, at network quality as what a user can do and cannot do well on the network. And I get and warn that you should, be, you, should be, you, should, you should be aware of abstract applications as well, that video conferencing broadly is not Skype, which is not FaceTime, which is not Zoom, which is not WebEx. These are all abstract and the concrete is what matters. If you don't think of the concrete, the whole program is doomed, but then, Next slide, please. I decided that this was not a good way to win friends, so I decided to actually buckle down and write something that was more constructive. Next. And this is uh, uh, what you have in my paper, which is basically I uh, have three propositions here. Uh, the first proposition is that the internet exists in slices, that every user, so that's the end of Lewis Black mode, by the way. I'm back to being myself, uh, uh, for those of you who know me. Um, and this is a, a, the fact that a user only sees the slice of the internet that they actually exercise or they actually use. Next. And to be relevant to a user, any idea of quality of the internet must be measured and defined in terms of the many applications that that user might use over it. Because we care about how this applies to end users, this is important. Next. Finally, a user's perceived quality of the internet is is, is tied to this evolving human artifact, to the internet. And the properties of this network as perceived by a user are defined locally in time and in space by physical, social, political, and economic forces. So with these three propositions, next, I'll point uh, to uh, uh, just a couple of takeaways. Um, and these are effectively my position here and, and the point I want to make are that to be successful, any quality metric or measurement framework that we build or develop here must include or show strong correlation to real applications or real networks. And quality uh, 
uh, of those applications or real networks. Next. And applications change. As a result, no metric that we come up here with here or measurement framework that we come up with here will remain static and must be continually adapted to reflect this reality. That's all I have. Thanks, Keith. Thank you very much, Jana. Are there any clarifying questions? I didn't manage to wake everybody up yet. You left us speechless. Okay, well, thank you again, Jana. Uh, let's move on to our final speaker of this section. Uh, Yaakov Stein will tell us about the futility, the futility of quality of service. Yaakov. Yes, hi, everyone hear me? Um, yeah, I've spent, you can go on to the next slide. I've spent a lot of my uh, career uh, looking into QoS and uh, OEM mechanisms, performance monitoring, and things of that sort. Uh, can you go on to the next slide? Yes, thank you. Um, and basically, um, the reason that people use QoS is because it's related to QoE. Once again, it's, uh, I'm sure everyone here knows the difference, but QoE, I mean the subjective quality of experience as the end user feels it. QoS are a bunch of parameters which are basically um, objective. That is, they're not subjective. They can be measured in uh, defined well. They're easy to measure. That's the basic uh, property. Of it. You can find to be here some background uh, noise. I hope that doesn't bother too much. Um, uh, however, they, although easy to measure, these parameters are defined to be uh, correlated with quality of experience. As a matter of fact, we have lots and lots of equations, and this ties in with what we just heard in the previous talk. We have lots of equations of the form, given the application and perhaps details of the applications, like what the codec is and if it's a video or audio or things of that sort, and a bunch of quality of experience, uh, excuse me, quality of service parameters, such as its delay and packet loss and things of that sort, you can actually predict what the quality of experience will be. And the reason that's important is that people obviously are willing to pay for quality of experience. Um, people have gotten used to not paying for best effort services. You know, you get uh, Skype and uh, free email from Gmail and et cetera. All these services come uh, free if there's no guarantees, but if you have the best quality, uh, you're willing to pay a lot for it and there's some kind of interpolation in between those. So we'd really like to know the quality of experience and up to now we've been able to do it pretty well uh, either in a subjective way by putting people, you know, taking 32 people, putting, giving them headphones and letting them give scores and uh, estimating it or doing the objective way, which correlates well with the quality of experience. And that's the reason people have been doing performance measurement and, o and SLAs and QoS and et cetera. Next slide, please. However, the problem is, is that recently the kind of services that we give, the communication services, had fundamentally changed. Once upon a time, the, the uh, services that we gave were pure transport services. Basically, we said from point A to point B, move these bits, and we have at least this uh, data rate and no more than this delay. And that was it. But nowadays, we have mixed up communications and computation. We have a lot of non trivial computation happening along the path of the, pa of the uh, packets that go through the network. And it could be simple things like uh, uh, firewalling, simply not letting the packet go through or letting it go through. More complicated things like compressing the data, transcoding video, doing TCP proxy in the middle of re reassembling, re-segmenting uh, uh, f flows, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. And really complicated things like CDN. Now, the problem is that all the proof, all the, the relations I talked about before, that based on quality of service parameters that are easily measured, we could predict quality of experience, don't seem to hold. And as a matter of fact, they don't hold. Uh, and if they don't hold, that is quality of service doesn't necessarily allow you to predict quality of experience, then basically all these quality of service parameters that we have so much information about and so much uh, knowledge about how to measure them, they're basically meaningless. Next slide, please. And the proof that this is the case, that is you cannot find in general uh, a formula 
for a given application that given packet loss and packet loss rate and delay and jitter and all these things that you can find the quality of experience is based on a sequence of thought experiments. I simply point you to the paper which I sent in. Um, and this will show you that you can't actually uh, make it all work. And just the last thing I want to say is that NFV, that is making virtual functionalities, makes everything much worse because if the functionalities, the non trivial computation was in one particular place and I knew what it was, I could probably work around it and measure before and after. And the, but, but if I can bring a, fun, a new functionality and put it somewhere and move it from place to place, then you have to be aware that any at any time the quality of service can stop predicting what the quality of experience means, uh, what the quality of experience is, which means that the end user, even though you think you're giving a good service, uh, might be unhappy, and it could be around the other way around. You might think it's a really bad service, and the end user could be really happy with it. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, before we move on to the discussion, are there any clarifying questions? Wow, that many questions. Okay, well, hearing none, uh, I guess why don't we move on to our half hour of discussion. Uh, everyone gets 60 seconds. Um, and the first uh, discussant is Bob Briscoe. Hi there. They were pretty dismal talk. They sort of basically said, you can't do anything. Um, which is sort of, um, you know, doesn't really give us much hope. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I don't know whether it was just trying to um, be clever or something, but I don't think Yakov, that just because um, QoE isn't a, a pure function of Quas means you can't do anything. Um, and similarly, Jana, I don't think just because um, you know there there isn't a correlation between what the application, um, how the application quality is and the network quality is, or there isn't a strong correlation. It doesn't mean that if you say reduce delay at the uh, in in network packets by you know, I don't know seventy percent or something like that, you won't see any effect. I I think maybe you're 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 sort of both trying to look for some precision that isn't there, but maybe missing the propensity that right. bring some effect. Thank you. Our next discussion is Matt Mathis. Yeah, I'd like to respectfully disagree, Bob. I and I think the the problem here is that the the talks um are objecting to trying to boil the ocean by dividing the problem too broadly. And um, I think if you take out of them that actually what you want to do is have multiple metrics in different parameters, each focusing on certain aspects of application and network behavior, it's much more likely to be solvable. And solving, you then don't connect the failure of one metric to success or failure of another metric. So responsiveness to me means something very specific, which is different than jitter, which is different than throughput. And a responsiveness I, metric what, I, I agree with what help. you've said, but I don't think that's what either of the talks said. But anyway, yes, yeah. <laughs> yes, the talks the talks took unnecessarily extreme positions that sounded like yeah, boiling yeah. the ocean. All right, so can I interject oh. really quick for administrative? So a couple of things. Um, I should have mentioned this in my earlier slides, and I apologize for not doing that. A couple of things. We are using the chat for queuing. So if you put plus Q in the chat, the uh, moderator for the session will call on you. Um, the the general thinking is that we really want to have more interactive discussion so it won't be much like a panel where you've seen in the past where the speakers are really you know answering questions um so if the speakers could uh you could, the speakers can raise their hands and we might call on them uh, sooner but in general it's encouraged the speakers actually participate as part of the conversation rather than do this back and forth q a All right, shall we move on to John Iyengar? Thank you, Keith. Um, so I wanted to step in there very quickly because my name was raised a couple of times, but precise, Bob, because I think that there's this, and it's when you're trying to boil the ocean, but the idea is that ultimately an abstract metric has to be tied to something concrete and real. 
if it is to mean anything at all. If you have an abstract metric that doesn't correlate to any, you know, if you say that this is supposed to do well for video conferencing, but you can't demonstrate that it does well for either Zoom or WebEx or Skype or what have you, then there's something wrong, right? I mean, there's basically something, ultimately the point of this is to show that the artifacts and the usage of the internet gets better, not in some abstract notion of the internet. So that was kind of my point is that we need to not just have an idea, ideation around what abstract metrics make sense, but also tying it to real applications and showing that they can demonstrably move the needle for real application, because that's how we get deployment and buy in on those uh, on those kinds of things. Okay, next is Yakov. Yes, once again, John is saying something very similar to me, but coming from a different angle, just uh, getting back to what Bob was asking. Uh, my problem is not the precision. I'm not claiming that because of uh, these computations that now are happening in the network, uh, I'm off by 5%. It simply becomes completely meaningless. Think of a case of a CDN, for instance, and the end user is really getting bad quality. Uh, so you thinking that this is a normal path uh, and a lot of bandwidth somewhere where nothing is traveling because it's all popping up in the middle of the network and getting to the end user, right? So you're, you're wasting a lot of resources and doing absolutely nothing. I can give you a lot of examples like this where there, there are several counterintuitive ones where you reduce the delay and the quality of experience gets worse. Um, and once again, look at my paper and you see all these really, really bad things. The, the culmination is a uh, link break can sometimes actually improve things, right? So this is not that we're off by a few percent. It's simply that a lot of what we've been doing all these years has become meaningless. All right, Stuart Cheshire. Going back to the first comment from Bob, if I sounded pessimistic, then I apologize. That was not at all what I wanted to say. The reason I got involved with organizing this workshop is that I'm very optimistic that we can improve things in a big way. To do that, we need to focus attention in the right place. And my, my concern right now is that every end user who goes to an internet speed test it measures their throughput, and if lucky, they measure their idle ping time. But if we're not measuring the things that matter, then normal business dictates that engineering resources are put into optimizing the things that people are measuring. And as long as we're only measuring throughput, that's all we'll be working on in the industry. Uh, Wes? Yeah, so so you know, in some ways, I think it is a depressing set of talks, but it really set the 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 stage for what this workshop is trying to do. Right? We wouldn't need a three day workshop if this was an easy problem. Um, and I think you know the important points that I took away out of the talks, I think, are you know the understanding that generic metrics are hard, if not impossible, and that application specific metrics are potentially necessary. And one of the things that I, I think is interesting about that is the quality is likely different on all layers of the stack. Right? How do you measure, you know, a transport layer, you know, quality versus an application layer of quality? That's a difficult thing to do. How do you measure the fact that the quality of security authentication is really hard to get into an application that is otherwise good? Right? That's two totally different sets of qualities. So I look forward to this sort of helping set the stage for the workshop. Thanks. Uh, Rich Brown. Rich Brown, are you there? He's probably muted. Okay, why don't we move on and come back? Uh, next is Jim Geddes. Um, so it's one thing to have a metric. I think our bigger problems at this point is exposing them to people who can put pressure into the economic system that without key applications, pointing the finger to some extent as to what and hopefully where the problems are that the end user is experiencing will get nowhere no matter how good the, the metrics might be. So the metrics are important, but if we don't also work on the, the economic side, um, we will fail. That's where I think we've been for for a good part of a decade now. All right, Bob Briscoe. 
I just wanted to um, come back and apologise to Stuart. I did, wasn't actually including your talk in the in the um, his malady, um, and and also apologise to Yakov and Janet. It was it was more the um, maybe the overstatement of the claims. You know that, that um, yes, of course things have to be linked to to real applications and stuff like that. But um, it it doesn't mean this. So, say for instance, you invent a new way of taking a round out of a TLS negotiation or something like that. Whether or not you link that to um, certain applications of the day, doesn't matter, it will improve things. You know, it, it's... Yakov, do you want a 10 second response? Okay, a real quick one. Uh, I wasn't trying to be uh, negative or pessimistic. I was simply saying we're doing things wrong, especially people like in the, uh, a carrier Ethernet level where they have mm. SAs which specifically say what the packet loss rate has to be measured in 15 minute intervals. However, there are some really, really good things about all this. Number one, the kinds of measurements I was talking about before, the estimations can be done not only on QoS parameters, but on end user data nowadays. So you could actually put on the end user application something which starts feeling something wrong and ask the end user, like when you're driving in ways it asks you. Are you in a, in a, in a, is there a accident in front of you? Are you in a uh, traffic jam? And you say, yes. And that information being reported is actually very useful. All right. Omar Shapira. Oh, uh, uh, I want to share 1 uh, observation regarding Jana and Yaakov, um, uh, statement. And this is that in the last 10 years. The rate of change in the internet has accelerated from one router every three years to one uh, virtual function, probably if, if uh, at extreme every five minutes. And today, uh, based on my experience building a Facebook CDN, today it is possible to shift uh, half of the traffic of a continent. Uh, within 15 minutes uh, and uh, the effects it will have on on the internet are mm -hmm. immense and yet uh, having just one metric may be may be confusing and misleading this is my comment thank you all right rich brown has returned why don't we go back to rich okay very good is my microphone working this time yes we hear you okay uh I, I hunger for a day when vendors, router manufacturers, and service providers compete on the basis of responsiveness in the same way they compete on speed up to X megabits, and it's responsive too. Um, a lot of good thoughts gone into all these papers. Uh, the end-to-end -end and longitudinal measurement systems are important, but we need to make sure those measurements aren't skewed by badly behaved CPE. And I think I'm jumping on what uh, Jim Geddes just said. If if the CPE is queuing hundreds of milliseconds of data, uh, no amount of optimization is going to make things better. Um, in, my, in my little town of 1,700 people, I turned a lot of people onto commercial routers that use FQCODL to make their 7 megabit DSL responsive. And they were all delighted, but it doesn't scale. Rich Brown going to your house or telling you on the local listserv doesn't work. I can't apple seed the world. The challenge right. for this group. Oh, am I out? Yeah, oh. you're out. Well, we, we, we can put you back in if you queue right, again. Thanks. Right. Let us go to Matt Mathis. Matt Mathis calling again. Missed my mute button. <laughs> Uh, I think one of the things that is biting us is is that the idea of an abstract metric is makes it perhaps too big. The way I think about this problem is like a food labels, uh, f uh, food ingredient labels or food uh, nutrition labels. What we haven't decided on is what the rows need to be in the network f food label. And each of these arguments applies independently for each row in the food label and then there's a separate problem which is deciding which rows you keep and which rows don't work well enough and i think if you may look at it hierarchically of of finding different 
largely orthogonal ways of measuring the network and focusing on improving the quality of each of those. Uh, clearly, speed is one of them, and I think responsiveness is going to turn out to be the next one. Um, and work through the list, it will gradually get better for everything. Uh, jitter is in real time is a completely third one. Great, John I. Inger. Thanks, Keith. Um, so I uh, want to quickly respond to an earlier comment by Bob and perhaps others as well after that. To say that it's, I don't think that it's pessimistic to, well, I could, I, the way I, I came off might have sounded pessimistic, but I think I was trying to be, trying to bring caution perhaps to getting carried away to a very academic exercise, which might not ultimately, to Jim Gettis's point, drive adoption. Ultimately, if we want to actually find what the economic buttons are, one of the strong economic buttons are improve application performance, and that's going to get you something. Um, so I just want to bring, uh, I, I still think that it's important for us to uh, consider how, whatever it is that we do here, if, if you are chasing either a metric or a framework or whatever it is that we're chasing that we incorporate and bring in uh, real applications into the picture there. Stuart Cheshire. Thanks. Coming back to Bob again, um, I'm going to push back on what you said, Bob, that saving the round trip time on TLS is bound to improve things and we don't have to demonstrate it. The way uh, my group works at Apple in software, we're very driven by demos. And if we go to the VP with uh, slides showing statistics, his answer is always, show me the demo. And if we have some technology, whether it's to do with the hard disk or whatever, uh, if we can't demonstrate a user visible benefit, then then maybe our assumptions are wrong. So I do think, uh, and you're probably right, shaving a TLS round trip does help, but you need to demonstrate that to show that we're not making faulty assumptions. And I want to make one plea to everybody. Let's stop saying speed when we mean capacity. Uh, uh, an oil tanker carries lots of cargo, but it's not faster than a speedboat. So as long as we keep saying speed when we mean capacity, we're perpetuating this myth that is what got us here in the first place. Alexander Clem. Hi, I, uh, I want to comment on the earlier comments uh, that really actually it's the quality of experience that counts at the end of the day, not, not just the quality of service. And while I agree with that, uh, I think at the same time, we need to be careful to not actually conflate actually what the application does and what the network does. You know, I think one of the main issues today is also often the finger pointing issue. Right? So, for instance, okay, you experience poor, poor application performance, and okay, maybe I'm bad. What was the example? Skype is not the same as, uh, as, as, as some other. Uh, application, uh, but uh, you don't know what the issue often is as an end user. Is it basically the net network? Is it the application? Is it some something else in the uh, in the stack? So I think, as much as we would like to have just one metric, one thing that gives the entire user experience, I am actually pessimistic that we can actually do that. And I do think actually layering and structuring and segmenting and basically dividing, well, basically separating the concerns really applies here and is going to be important here if we want to make uh, progress, even if it. Even if to the user, it's uh, yeah they, they want to talk about the application, but I think for the network and uh, support net, as network engineers, we do need to uh, talk a little bit uh, yeah more differentiated, I guess. Roberto, uh, Roberto, are you there? Okay, moving on. Neil Davies. I, just to come back to this issue of the of the metric, um, I think one of the ways of of viewing this that we found useful is uh, to talk about application outcomes or to look at things like, um, you know, for video on demand, it's the probability that you will get a buffering event in an hour of watching, you know, if, if for for or the time to the first frame, or you know, there are there are a whole bunch of metrics like this which are all really based upon measurable outcomes. That you could measure in various ways, and I think that you can relate. It is possible to relate for a given application for a given uh, setup. How, as the network quality changes, that application experience changes. And I mean, I, I think we're coming up, we're coming from this that the user experience is what matters, 
and it's the user experience that what is what people value. All right, thank you. Let's go back to Roberto. Um, I wanted to echo Gianna's point about uh, real world applications. I think it's very apropos. It's hard to motivate uh, any work without that. Uh, I also want to say that it's also pretty clear that we have applications that are competing in terms of their requirements. Um, so they're the ones that care about capacity and the ones that care about latency and jitter. And I'm very curious if we found any application that doesn't fit into those buckets, because if so, it does help simplify. All right, uh, wonderful. Uh, Wes Hardiker. So a number of interesting things have cropped up, right? Is that user experience, as, as Neil just said, is the user experience that matters, right? And one of the challenges of this work is going to be how do you measure subjectiveness of that user experience? And the flip side of that is what experiences don't matter, right? If, if we're gonna measure the things that do, we should also be able to figure out how to exclude things that don't. For example, in JavaScript, we put, you know, we put JavaScript scripts at the bottom of the HTML file to make sure that it loads last because it doesn't matter as much. DNS result, you know, uh, speed to resolvers matter a whole lot. It directly affects the users, but responsiveness to the root servers has been demonstrated not to matter as much, but people seem to still care anyway. SMTP was designed not to matter. Nobody, you know, as long as it's there in a reasonable period of time, we don't need it to be that much faster. All right, uh, Toki Hoyland Jorgensen. Yeah, I was going to bring up a point going back to something Stuart said in, talk, in his talk about consistency. So I think there's a uh, an analogy here to proving a negative, right? Because a lot of things, an application that's responsive can be responsive most of the time. Um, but if your delay goes up by 200 milliseconds as soon as someone starts a um, a download that's not going to work for your video conferencing but when you go and measure it it's fine that like, this was the, one of the original things that that jim discovered when he coined the whole buffer blow thing right that you have this issue that goes away as soon as you start looking at it and much as i hate speed tests one of the nice things about it is bandwidth is really easy to measure because you measure something that's there whereas for a lot of the responsiveness metrics you really want to measure the absence of delay All right, thank you. And I'm sorry, I skipped Bob Briscoe. Uh, hi, I, I, I don't want to go on about this. I, I mean, I, I generally agree with Yana, Yana and um, Jana, sorry, and um, Echo. Just, I just um, wanted to say that, yes, you need to link things to application experience, you know, to, to, to real applications. But I don't want to put that up as a barrier for someone who is, knows what they're doing and knows that you know, cutting out a load of delay is going to be good, but they, you know, they, they can't get anywhere unless they produce some demo of something. But where, where all the existing applications are written for today's internet, and so they won't demonstrate it, and so you have to write a whole application just to prove that this massive thing you're trying to do works. You know, I mean, in my own work, I've always done that. I'm just saying I don't want to, I don't want to make this into a, um, a religion that you have to demonstrate everything. And even though I would myself, you know, it, it, there are cases where things are obvious. No, so Bob, you're all about dismantling religions. religions. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's move on to Jana Iyengar. Nice one there, Keith. Um, I, I'll respond very quickly to Bob to say I don't think that it's it's a it's a I don't think it's a barrier I'm presenting or or we are presenting. It's a barrier that naturally presents itself. If you're not able to demonstrate, as Stuart is pointing out, it's difficult to get things uh, uh, accepted and deployed. So I want to come back to something that Wes asked about how do you find uh, uh, what, what the right metrics are. And, and I, that's not quite what you asked, but I want to say that that's actually exactly why I wanted to bring in concrete applications. If you ask anybody at uh, uh, who's working on any of these products, so to speak, that we might think of using on the internet, they all first come up with metrics and then they build the product because or oftentimes at least because they want to keep improving the product and they are looking at particular metrics that drive usage. Uh, if you look at YouTube, for example, or Netflix or Zoom, they all have metrics. WebEx has its own metrics for exactly what it does uh, 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 for how uh, uh, to measure improvements, so to speak. 
and they might measure improvement in particular ways. Um, and those are important and useful. It's certainly valuable to generally say that uh, uh, video conferencing uh, uh, does better with responsiveness. I think I would agree with that. Uh, similarly, uh, video streaming, if you want to have fewer rebuffers, then you want to have a smaller buffer. So those are generalities, and I think those are perfectly fine and reasonable. But ultimately, when we're talking about a metric or metrics or a measurement framework, it becomes more important to actually think about the more specific. Praveen. I was wondering how this approach that is application centric would scale because when you're building infrastructure, let's say you're building a transport, you're dealing with a lot of different applications. So focus on one application might, you know, you might improve a metric on for one application might end up harming another application. So uh, generally, you know, how as, you know, infrastructure builders, how do we deal with the diversity of applications? I think that becomes a challenge with the application centric approach. Jim Geddes. Um, this again, I'll, I'll keep banging on the, the economic drum. Right now, basically people are either given insufficient or bad information at, without any knowledge of where problems are occurring. So they can't do anything, they can't vote with their dollars. One of the first things that we discovered in the buffer bloat work was we didn't have measurement tools and statistics. Um, Toki went off and built a tool. Um, but that economic pressure has to happen and it needs to be at least approximately integrated into, into applications whenever possible so, so it can say, um, I don't think my app is, is the problem here, but it smells like it's, someplace else please go do some um uh some uh tests to try to point some fingers we have to put economic pressure into the system all right christoph oh yes um on on the question of the network quality for certain applications um I think it's important to keep in mind that while well, people use many different applications at the same time or different people use different applications at the same time on the same network. And as Stuart mentioned in his part of the talk is that the internet is a shared network and we want the network to be good for all applications, even if they run concurrently. Um, there's no reason why a software update can't coexist with a WebEx call. It should be, should be working fine. Um, and I, I, I think it's more about we need to identify classes of use cases. Let's say uh, male and uh, people are more, they are the power users and then there are the, the people that work from home and then there are people that just use mail and web and identify metrics or groups of metrics for these kind of classes. Uh, Anna Brunstrom, Carl State University. Uh, yes, I just wanted to add that I think if we, it's very important also that we think about who the metric is for. So I, I fully uh, agree with Jan that in the end, for the end user, of course, it's the application performance that, that matters. I think what Bob and, and Praveen maybe was touching on is that if we think about the whole development of solutions and, and applications, maybe not during that whole development, that's the only metric we would have. We would also need other metrics, of course, to to guide us during during that process, even if in the end it's the application performance that will matter. So I think different users also need, need different uh, or different roles may also need different metrics. Uh, Torlis Eckert. So when Yakov mentioned uh, VMs make life harder, I was remembered of the uh, first IBM computers who supposedly inserted so that the interactive experience was uh, very persistent and people wouldn't understand that you know they could get at low usage time get uh, much faster um, response times than over high load nowadays um, we have you know the majority of internet traffic being um, supposed streaming that has a playout buffer of up to 30 seconds to give you an average uh, bitrate experience under that you know uh, capacity seeking uh, performance of the internet. So maybe at some point in time we wake up and see that the best effort service for the quote internet isn't the only thing that we should be focusing on. 
you know, in the majority of uh, private networks that are uh, doing, you know, uh, mission uh, critical uh, services in the network. We have a lot more of uh, the services for uh, network transport that we've uh, defined in the IETF than in the internet. Uh, Jeff Houston. Look, I think part of this issue is, is actually a fluid or a flow dynamic problem. You know, the network just doesn't give a flow capacity. The network actually relents if a flow exerts pressure on the network. And interestingly, you know, like many fluid dynamic problems, the higher the pressure you exert on the system, the greater the resistance to actually giving more resources to that particular flow. And so if you think about this, the outcome is all about dynamic equilibration and it's not a static resource allocation. And a lot of these measurement arguments are just trying to measure static resources. That won't work. The key is all about responsive networks. And oddly enough, I think this gets all about buffer sizes within the network more than anything else. And as for economic pressure, it's clear to me that QoS is largely a market failure. Economics is not going to solve your problem here. Thanks. All right, well, that's the end of the queue. Wes, let me turn it over to you. All right, thanks very much. Um, I see Vint has actually logged in, which is fantastic. If Vint, if you're here, uh, please go ahead and start sharing your screen. Um, uh, in, in the meantime, um, I'll give a real quick recap. I think uh, the past you know, half an hour has been a very interesting discussion. It really sh has shown the breadth of the problem that we have. Uh, it, it really has, uh, I think shown how much, you know, we have to think about all layers of the stack, as I mentioned earlier, as well as uh, thinking about does the network matter if you don't have enough compute cycles to actually produce the non-static uh, content to, to draw directly on Jeff's comment. Uh, Vint, are you here yet? Yeah, can you not hear me? And see me? I can hear you now. Do you have slides today or no? No, I don't. You got it. Just okay, that's fine. <laughs> that's just fine. So it's my pleasure to introduce Vint Cerf to you all. Um, I'm sure most of you know him. He's uh, the formal type formal title at Google is Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist, and he's widely known as you know one of the fathers of the internet. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, he is the author of RFC 0013, which is probably one of the shortest RFCs you'll ever read. So I uh, suggest <laughs> you go look it up. It does have an ASCII diagram at following the one paragraph of two sentences. Vint, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have slides. Uh, you know, the chief internet evangelist goes around doing sermons. And so uh, this is my sermon, which I do not think is going to take an hour. Uh, my calendar says there's this hour slot here. What, well, we, it's a half an hour now, but go ahead. <laughs> well, it, in, in any event, even a half an hour might turn out not to be necessary. However, just having tuned in uh, and hearing some of the dialogue, I don't think you'll have any problem at all uh, reacting to uh, some of the things I'd like to suggest. Uh, so it, it, the good thing is it's all virtual and then in, any incoming is going to be uh, virtual fruit as opposed to the real thing. Uh, so uh, first of all, I, I just want to tell you how important this session is, not mine, but the, the entire uh, arrangement. Uh, I'm so happy to see the IAB uh, convening this, and I think it's indicative of the recognized importance of the question of performance that so many people have gone to the trouble of actually preparing material ahead of time, uh, evaluating it, uh, and, uh, and sending um, print-ready copy so that the rest of the community will have an opportunity to see what you had to say. So I really think this is an important uh, event in, uh, in our story. Uh, the second, uh, just a tiny net, uh, this is not a complaint, it's actually a thank you that we're paying attention to buffer bloat. Uh, Dave Taut and others uh, have been beating the drum and maybe their heads uh, against this problem for a long time. And I think it's demonstrably quite real. The question of course is what to do about it uh, and how to go about uh, doing that. And the most recent uh, episodes have been uh, looking at uh, Starlink, which of course is one of the newest large scale infrastructure builds underway. Uh, and I'm hoping that the Starlink team will recognize that this is a performance issue that deserves attention and can be, uh, can be dealt with with uh, thoughtful uh, implementation and tests. Uh, the third thing I wanted to mention is that it's very timely 
for uh, for all of you to be looking not only at uh, the potential to adjust the TCP protocol to do a better job of performing uh, across the network, but I think we also should feel free, and I believe uh, the submitted papers demonstrate that exploration of other protocols at that layer uh, are uh, deserving of attention, and that's QUIC, for example, which is an alternative to uh, the TCP TLS combination. There are other real time protocols uh, as well, but I want to emphasize um, a, the importance here of feeling free to uh, consider alternatives to the original core protocols. Since many years have, uh, have evolved and a lot has happened to TCP implementations, but there are other things that people are trying to do that might work better uh, with uh, alternative implementations. And, uh, you know, some people might imagine that I would uh, cling, you know, like a teddy bear to uh, the original TCP IP work. I'm proud of what we did. I'm uh, happy that so many people have contributed. I'm glad to see that it's still in use, uh, but I'm not afraid to admit that there might be conditions and applications for which it is not best suited. And I'll come back to that uh, in a little bit. Uh, the fourth thing I wanted to mention may not be a primary topic of this uh, uh, symposium, but I still would like to see IPv6 implemented across the internet. And I feel like a little bit like beating the drum for, since 1996, hoping that, uh, that we will get there. I know it has flaws and I wish that we had thought more carefully about the uh, interoperability with IPv4. Uh, in, uh, although I don't want to sound uh, like apologist here, I will admit to you that in 1996, I thought that um, it would be so obvious that the, uh, of the advantage of this relatively simple uh, variation on IPv4 that people would just go implement it and get it over with so we'd have some more address space. That didn't happen, and uh, you may have different explanations for this, uh, the one which I've come to uh, think is, is might be uh, at least relevant is that 1996 was about the point where the dot boom was happening because Netscape Communications, which was formed in 94, uh, went public in 1995, its stock went through the roof, and everybody was throwing money at anything that looked like it had something to do with the internet. And the result must have been, hey, we got lots of address space, what's the problem? Let's go build some something and make money. And so we did not catch uh, the moment uh, to get V6 done until, of course, the rapid expansion of the internet made it harder to get there, especially considering we didn't really run out in a severe way until 2011, which was at that point uh, some 15 years in the future. Uh, at least that's my uh, my uh, little apology uh, for, uh, for not getting to IPv6, but I still think we should get there. Um, the, the fifth point I wanted to make has to do with the fact that we may be operating in a space with dramatically different par uh, parameters than uh, we have had before. And that parametric variation justifies, in my opinion, uh, re-examination and scrutiny, not just of transport protocols, but possibly a lot of the others. That, uh, that make up the internet. And so the idea of looking at performance in many different dimensions, whether it's latency, jitter, uh, absolute bandwidth, or other uh, you know, reachability uh, and a variety of other metrics is timely, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and it probably is a little mind stretching when you start uh, changing the parameters in which the protocols operate, the, the maximum latencies, for example, or the uh, rate of discontinuity, uh, you begin to see um, alternative designs that might work better than the, what we'll call the classic TCP. A good example of that, of course, is the bundle protocol work, which has gone on with the interplanetary internet effort. Uh, and there you can see very quickly that uh, ping is not your friend. You don't have a, a very good estimate for how long it will be before a response to an echo packet would show up, especially if it's a multi hop and disconnected, frequently disconnected system. There are a whole lot of things. Network management doesn't work very well. DNS is questionable if the round trip times are 40 minutes to four hours. 
uh, and there's a possibility that the IP address you got back from the DNS turns out to be wrong by the time you get it because somebody moved to a different network and got a different IP address. These kinds of parametric changes uh, could also happen terrestrially, not quite in the same way. I don't expect the speed of light to be uh, altered in such a way that it takes four hours to get from uh, here to a geosynchronous satellite and back. But, um, but there are uh, parametric variations in uh, even a terrestrial environment. Uh, breakage uh, and lack of connectivity would be an obvious one, especially as we rely increasingly on uh, radio-based protocols, uh, you know, 5G, 4G, uh, 6G, whatever the hell that is, uh, Wi-Fi and others. So, um, so I think that these parametric variations deserve our attention and might even drive alternative protocol design. Um, this sixth thing that I wanted to suggest to you and which I suspect this uh, conference may generate uh, is, uh, well, I'll call this a, a desirable properties exercise. As we look at the uh, various um, parametric spaces in which we are expecting our protocols to work, I can imagine wanting to have a kind of a document that says something about desirable properties of transport protocol design in varying parameter spaces. And it's the desirable properties thing that I'd like to encourage attention uh, to, because we want to ask, what is it that we want to get out of these uh, protocols, either the existing ones tuned in some way or new ones that are aimed at particular uh, performance? Um, among the desirable properties might very well be low latency, for example. And you, you will all recall that when the IP was split from the original TCP design, it was for purposes of dealing with real-time communication that did not require 100% delivery of all the data. Uh, the the uh, one-liner description of that for me while I was at ARPA was, you want to know where the missile is now, not where it was. And that was enough to justify a lot of people's attention to splitting IP off from TCP to say nothing of real-time speech and, and video. But I think an exercise that makes us cite what the desirable properties are of the protocol suites that we're working on would be very helpful because it, it will help um, others to understand what's driving a particular uh, vector, a particular design vector or a particular implementation vector. So I've always found that to be a very useful uh, exercise. I have only two other things I wanted to bring up. One of them has to do with backward compatibility. Uh, the, the painful uh, IPv4, IPv6 situation uh, might conceivably have been uh, done better, uh, particularly if there had been a way to uh, arrange for a backward compatibility mode for IPv6 and IPv4, uh, but I could never quite figure out how to get the IPv4 32-bit address space to contain 128 bits of address in order to refer to a v6 target that didn't exist at the time that the IPv4 protocols were developed and, and the nomenclature uh, uh, designed. Uh, I, I, if I were uh, able to talk to my younger self, I think I would have said something around 1992 about how deployment was really important and backward compatibility ought to be given uh, deeper consideration. At this point, it's, uh, it's a bit late for that, uh, for V4 and V6, but it is not necessarily late for thinking about variations on uh, existing protocols you know, to make them, to adapt them to, uh, to new parametric spaces. But we should keep in mind that uh, making them backward compatible is extremely valuable for, uh, for introduction uh, into use. And so if I had a list of desirable properties, that would be certainly one of them for sure. Uh, and the last point I wanted to make, and I see that I've only used about 11 minutes so far, um, which is I don't need to use more than you can stand and I have to offer. But the last one I wanted to mention has to do with performance across multiple hops in the internet. Uh, it's it, one of the reasons that we have not seen uh, a kind of end-to-end -end, 
um, that other than Andy Wayne best efforts has been the difficulty of achieving uh, a any other metric across multiple hops. I mean, it's certainly true that that pairwise um, interactions have sometimes led to special agreements uh, by you know handshake between two network operators who want to offer something to their respective customers that's other than purely best efforts. But getting that to work over three networks that are, you know, in, with one in between has turned out to be much harder. And so it's an important question as you're thinking about uh, alternative implementations and designs to ask the question, can we get this to work across the multi-hop environment? Having said that, I think Jeff Houston and others would probably uh, reinforce my sense anyway, that the multi-hop network is uh, beginning to evaporate and it's being replaced by an increasingly connected environment where users get connected almost directly to uh, a destination uh, network. For example, in the case of, of Google, we have a very big network we call B2, and that is out facing out into the internet environment. And for the most part, there is sufficient connectivity of that network to other network operators in what we think of as the public internet, that it's really kind of a two hop or a one hop system because you get onto some ISP and that ISP has direct access to the Google B2 network. And then you're into the Google space. Uh, and the same argument could be made, I suppose, for Amazon and others. Uh, I haven't done the appropriate homework to look at the BGP tables, uh, the forwarding tables to confirm that view, but uh, perhaps some of you have and can say something about the shifting uh, architecture of the internet where an increasing number of large players have substantial networking capability and uh, heavy connectivity uh, with the rest of the, uh, the public internet. So, as you think about improvements in design and uh, parametric uh, adaptation, uh, it seems to me we should be asking ourselves, what does the, um, what does the multi-hop situation look like uh, in this environment? Uh, I'm, I'll, I actually have a couple of other things that have just occurred to me while I was, was uh, talking. So let me add a ninth observation, and that has to do with the use of broadcast capability. Uh, we, I don't think that multicast has, has quite caught on except the anycast thing, which has been very useful, for example, for the root zone uh, propagation. But it occurs to me that in the radio world, we have not taken a lot of advantage, at least to my knowledge, in the fact that when you transmit a radio signal, multiple parties can receive it. Um, we tend to turn those things into point-to-point -point links, as we appear to have done with Wi-Fi, for example. So, um, assuming that I am not incorrect, assuming I'm right about that, there might be some utility in thinking more about taking advantage of broadcast, uh, physical broadcast media, uh, where uh, we broadcast and hope that mostly everybody got it, and the ones who didn't, there's a recovery mechanism to get the stuff you missed. Um, I'm, this is very different, I think, from the uh, multicast uh, architecture where you're in a wired environment and you have to physically replicate packets as they pass into the next network environment in order to emulate what a, a broadcast would, or a multicast would look like. So um, I think I should stop there um, um, unless you want me to literally rattle on, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, at this point it would be stream of consciousness or unconsciousness and I'm hesitant to impose that on you. What I would like, though, uh, is to know uh, how far off the mark I am with any of these notions and whether you would add to them uh, some concrete foci uh, that, uh, that I haven't mentioned, but that you think should be important. So if, if it's uh, all right, Mr. Chairman, I'd stop there and invite uh, reactions from people who are still awake. 
That makes sense. Uh, Keith, can I ask you to run the queue again? Although I did put myself in the front, so I'll go ahead and start. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for, for talking to us today, Vint. Uh, you, you said a, a number of enlightening things, and I, I particularly like the notion that, you know, why do we use uh, wireless networks in point-to-point -point fashion? That's a very good point. If uh, everybody in the house is streaming the same movie, why are we doing that, right? But um, so my question to you is, given sort of your unique hindsight, uh, do you have any advice in you know developing workshops, developing metrics in this workshop today that can stand the test of time? I mean, so you know anything that we do today, it, you know, so much is going to change in the next you know decade or twenty years. Maybe IPv N will come out. I think we should stop numbering them. You know, um, how how can we how can we hope to come up with a subjective measurement today that will last the test of time? Well, several things occur to me. The first one is that uh, if you expect it to last for a long time, then uh, and you want to get it propagated into the system, my comment about backward compatibility is pretty important. Finding a way to introduce something that is easy for everyone to adopt on their own time schedule, as opposed to having to do a flag day, uh, is really important. It's also important to find uh, arguments that will cause people to um, conclude that they want that capability. So thinking about why that capability might be important uh, is a very important part of, uh, of your success. Uh, if I could go back to um, something I think I've learned in, in the course of my career, and that is that um, you can't do anything big unless you can figure out how to get help. And the only way you can get help is to convince somebody they want to do what you want to do. There's another word for this, it's called sales. And, you know, uh, while a lot of engineers sort of dismiss sales as, oh, you know, those rah-rah guys over there, I have to report to you that if the sales guys don't succeed, you may not get paid, so that's the first issue. And the second one is there's a wonderful uh, work example of salesmanship in a book uh, called Tom Sawyer, where uh, some of you, if you've read it, remember he was whitewashing a fence and he managed to convince his friends that this would be fun for them to do. And, and all he offered was an apple core, which is, you know, pretty weak inducement. So, uh, so I would say better learn to sell the idea if you want it to have widespread uh, adoption. I don't think there's, well, let's see. What, uh, <laughs> of course, if I could have whispered to my, what was then 28 year old self or something, IPv6, uh, and, and then said, pick 128 bits of address space, um, we would have avoided this hassle. However, to be absolutely honest with you, can you imagine in 1973 being told you're going to need 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses for your network in about 50 years. So you better start now with that. Um, it, you know, the, the hell, we didn't even know if this thing was going to work at all. And the number of addresses that were in IPv4 was more than the human population of the planet at the time. So I have a feeling even if I sounded credible to my younger self, I would be laughed out of the room as, a, as an old fart, which I am today. Okay, next question. Expressions from Jim Geddes. Um, Vint, where in the network do you think our biggest quality problems lie today? Um, I assert it's primarily at the edge um, in people's in people's devices, in their homes, in the last hop or two uh, to the ISP, and that that's that's my assertion. Um, so, and you you and I are pretty much in agreement. Although I would uh, there there let's let's dig down a little bit into some nuance. Uh, the first observation I would make is that people's Wi-Fi systems are poorly tuned, generally speaking. We don't have wonderful tools, at least that I'm aware of, for helping people configure them well, putting in repeaters where they would do the most good. Sometimes you put in repeaters and they cause interference and that makes it worse. Um, so we have that problem. And a lot of the speed tests that people run don't take into account or don't uh, um, exhibit uh, surface. At poorly configured Wi-Fi environment. So 
but that's still out of the edge. So you and I are still in sync there. Second, I certainly agree that the uh, you know, routers that we use to get access to the public internet uh, that have buffer boat problems uh, are a significant component of, of performance variation. However, there is a piece of the global internet which uh, is potentially troublesome, and that's where the uh, ISPs interconnect. Whether that's at an IXP or whether it's a direct you know, peer to peer connection, there are cases uh, that have been well documented, partly by the MLAB measurements that have been gone, going on since the last 11 or 12 years now, uh, where some ISPs have chosen not to upgrade where they should have in terms of um, uh, providing adequate bandwidth in the inter core interconnects of the net. I would say, however, that for the most part, the core networks uh, are operating at extremely high capacity. We're running at 400 gigabits a second in most of our backbones now, and with, with some possibility of moving to even higher capacity uh, on those optical channels. So I don't think the core of the net, except at the interconnect points, is, tends to be as big a problem uh, as the edge. So you and I are largely in agreement there. Um, just as a quick follow up, Jim, uh, I'm sorry, I got to catch you up. We got a ton of people in the queue. Let me try and get to everyone. And we'll come back to you. Sorry about that. Let's go to Stuart Cheshire. Thank you, Vint. I 100% agree with your comments about for new technology to deploy, you have to think about backwards compatibility, leading to coexistence, leading to transition, and eventually wide deployment. You commented about multicast. I arrived at Stanford for my PhD in the summer of 1990, right about the time that Steve Deering had invented IP multicast. And 30 years later, we've yet to see really any widespread usage of it. We imagined back then we'd have broadcast TV over the internet, and what we actually have is YouTube with everybody watching their own customized content. When it comes to Wi-Fi, uh, all modern Wi-Fi systems have multiple antennas on the access point and on the client, and they use phasing to plant the signal energy where the receiver is. So ironically, with today's Wi-Fi, unlike coax Ethernet, coax Ethernet was truly a broadcast medium. One packet goes everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now with Wi-Fi, one packet actually gets planted on the receiver that you want it to get. And with multi-user MIMO, it can actually be sending multiple unicast to different clients at the same time. And coming back to the earlier theme people have mentioned, a lot of it is uh, measurement and money because people measure unicast throughput. That's where all the research spending has gone in WIFOs to make the unicast performance off the chart. All good points, Stuart. It's so good to see you, by the way. You too. Thanks, Vint. Uh, Jared Mouch. Uh, Stuart and others pretty much said everything that I was going to say, which is that uh, you know, the, the only other thing about multicast that's a big issue is billing, is that there's no good way to account for and bill for uh, these things. We're still in networks that are where people want to pay per bit, um, especially when you talk about this interconnection problem. A lot of it's about who wants to get paid for what bits. Uh, it's disappointing that I have a higher connection uh, at my house, a uh, higher speed connection at my house than uh, some carriers have as their gl global interconnection between two large providers. <laughs> Um, it's, I, I, I really want to name and shame those carriers, even though they've di disclosed that information to me privately, but it, it is very, very disappointing that we're in, we're in that state. And this, the same, I think can be said as well about the QoS discussion, which is that, uh, broadly you can get networks that have good QoS if you pay somebody for them and they will happily build you a private network with the QoS properties that you want. But when it comes to the public internet. There's no guarantees once you leave that particular carrier. Um, and then, you know, the other comments about CP, et cetera. So I think everything else was largely said, but I think, you know, yeah, the, that billing component and uh, the major interconnection issues, they're still out there. And a lot of the companies like Google, um, I work for Akamai in my day job, uh, we've built backbones to work around all of these congested, congestion issues uh, largely because of that. So thank you. Thank you, Jared. All right, let's move on to Vesna Manolovich. Hello. Uh, thank you for uh, mentioning the um, 
design for the future. And considering that, uh, I would uh, suggest, uh, or at least for me personally, one uh, desirable property would be ecological sustainability. Ah, so, uh, yeah, since we are uh, talking about uh, measuring and maximizing the quality of network service, I would think that we should also kind of try to balance that with minimizing the ecological impact. So, uh, what do you think about that? So, actually, this is a really interesting point. I had not thought about that as carefully and specifically as you have. I'm going to expand on that for a second and suggest to you that there is a metric that is frequently used by economists called GDP. And it is an additive metric about how much money is being spent on products and services. What is never included in GDP is the negative impact of the business on the environment, for example. I think we need some negative elements of GDP and the same argument could be made for performance on the internet if there are costs associated with it that are negative in effect that, that are harmful, we ought to account for that as well. Uh, so, um, so I think you're right to ask that question and raise that. So hang on to that as one of the metrics by which we evaluate our designs. All right, thank you. Uh, Eve Schooler. Hi. Um... It's great to see you, Vint, um, and to hear your thoughts. I was uh, riffing on what Vesna was saying. I was violently agreeing with her. Um, and there are metrics that, you know, like carbon intensity, that again, if we consider as a cost mes metric, um, which, which would mean um, how uh, carbon intense is, say, the path through which you might route your data that might help uh, towards your, you know, accounting for your negative impact as, as you were describing it. And so I, I wonder, um, you know, how many other, uh, folks thinking about metrics are considering things like, um, uh, you know, delay. And, and this goes back to something that you've held near and dear around the delay tolerant networks is maybe you'll hold on to data until such time as. Uh, the renewables are available, or there's excess renewables when the cost of renewables is even lower. Um, and so something like a carbon intensity metric might be something to weigh against delay uh, or uh, latency. So that's a really interesting idea. Of course, not all applications have the ability to accept this kind of artificial delay. Um, but the cases where it can, where an application is uh, is capable of, of being delay tolerant, it's a very interesting idea to allow someone to say, I would prefer my packets to go on the least, um, you know, expensive, uh, environmentally expensive path, uh, despite the fact that that might involve uh, delay. Uh, Eve, I have to ask you, am I remembering correctly that we were both at UCLA way back in the late 1960s? <laughs> No, no, that predates me. <laughs> it predates you. So there's there's another there's another woman whose name is almost exactly the same as yours that I am remembering. But I was affiliated with UCLA for a little bit, yes. Okay. Um, and and Caltech, where where our paths crossed, and of course the internet and the ITF. Um, but yes, this I, I think you know some of the things that Google is doing uh, with regards to shifting workloads to follow mm -hmm. the sun. Um, exposes, at least to the Google ecosystem, things like carbon intensity um, in order to make those calculations. Um, the question is, do would places like the Googles and the Facebooks and the AWSs of the world that have these hyperscaler data centers consider opening up, you know, the algorithms that they use or the metrics that they consider so that as edge computing um, uh, arrives on the scene and, and we expose, um, we want to maybe load balance the network um, by considering uh, the network carbon footprint, not just the data center carbon footprint, whether there are things, uh, whether we could see what it is that Google is doing inside to, to do that sort of load balancing inside their networks. Is that something that uh, is ripe for standardization? That's what I think of. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I know we're uh, out of time here. I will say, however, that one wants to go after the largest contributor to uh, carbon uh, consumption 
first. And to be honest, that tends to be the big data centers. So we put an enormous amount of effort into reducing power requirements, uh, paying for uh, low carbon or zero carbon uh, uh, electricity production and or taking you know like 30 year contracts. Uh, and recently we've announced that we're, that we're trying to uh, replenish the water that we use up uh, in evaporative cooling, for example. So um, I, I think that your idea has merit, although I wonder if we can get a, a sense of what uh, absolute impact the rerouting of traffic would have in terms of consumption versus some other steps that we might take that might be more directly uh, effective at reducing our carbon footprint. All right, thank you very much for your time, Vint. We hope you can stick around, but we certainly understand if you can't. Um, but we'll we'll turn it back into our, our workshop program now with more uh, rapid fire presentations and followed by discussion. But uh, oh. we greatly appreciate your, your coming to join us today. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate uh, being invited as the talking dinosaur. <laughs> uh, and I, I will hang around. I can hang around for uh, another uh, 28 minutes, with, so I'll be happy. Excellent. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll do two uh, short presentations. I'll turn it back over to Keith to, for that, and then we'll join the discussion. As, and you're welcome to join theirs as well. All right. Thank you, Wes. Our next talk is from Pedro Casas, uh, 10 years of Internet QE measurements. Pedro, why don't you take it away? Yeah. Hey, hi. Thanks. Um, I saw you change the, the format of the slides. So I was just checking, actually, my first paper on, on working on QE dates back to um, 16 years ago. So I could say 15 years of internet QE measurements. Um, so the idea is to understand, on the one hand, a bit more about QE measurements, per se, and if these tell us what do we need from the network side. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so, so here, basically, I talk about the term internet QE, about thinking user experience in a broader a perspective, not only thinking of QE as a, a user-centric lab study perspective, but something more global in which you consider real-world networks and services at scale. And you want to, basically through Internet QE, understand a bit more uh, the quality of data communication networks and services from the user-centric perspective. And why that? Because we always say that um, you cannot understand what you don't, uh, or let's say you cannot control what you don't understand and you cannot understand what you don't measure. So it's, for me, in my perspective, it's very important to understand uh, the user experience and quality of experience, but also how to uh, measure it. Um, the operation of networks through a user-centric understanding is very important. And I would just take the example of what you were saying in one of the presentations before about um, carbon footprint, or let's say more green operation of networks. So, so far, networking has been about over-provisioning, right? because of our provision is probably cheaper than then uh, adapting the network and having to uh, tolerate all the problems that may arise from there. But from a quality of experience perspective, over provisioning could be uh, or result in just a complete waste of resources because some extra resources might not really, at the end of the day, translate into better performance for the user or for the services. So it's very important, I would say, to, to understand uh, the user-centric perspective of the networks. So uh, actually QE driven or QE aware algorithms, they can help in better optimizing uh, the network, operating the network in a more efficient way. Thinking from traffic engineering, so more offline uh, conception of networks and so on, but also to more online monitoring, uh, just think about diagnosis of problems or detection of anomalies, understanding when there is a problem, you want to prioritize things that are really impacting the end customers or the end users. But QE modeling uh, measurement and assessment is super complex and time consuming. And so far we have had a, a discussion about QS is all wrong. We have to, what we have been doing is, is not good. I think uh, in, in that plot that I'm, in that figure that I'm showing uh, in the uh, bottom left, uh, QE perspective or the whole thing, it's a multi-layer thing. So we have to consider every layer. So the network layer for sure, the QS is, is important because it's what we control. But of course, if we want to understand what the user is experiencing, we have to get closer and we have to measure the application layer. And this becomes very complex because, of course, application layer do not offer in general APIs or information that can give us this type of information. But in order to understand all this, uh, and especially the end user, we have to be able to measure at different levels of the stack. Just remember that quality of experience is, is really complex because there is a lot of things mixed there about subjectivity. So there is personality usage, 
context, uh, device usability, and so on. So it's it's broader, but doesn't mean that we are not advancing in this direction. So uh, next slide, please. So from, from the experience on the Internet UE measurements, I, I would just, it's very difficult for me to, to summarize all the learnings, but at least I would like to share with you some, some comments. We were thinking or we were discussing at some point that uh, knowing how to deliver good or excellent quality is good because you can actually sell it. I would say the opposite. It's not probably that we can sell, but what is important to understand is that poor quality of experience, uh, it's bad, for example, for user engagement. So this, there are tons of studies understanding that when the performance from the user perspective is bad, things start going wrong in the, in the engagement perspective. So uh, if you think video streaming, when you think about rebufferings, video quality and quality switching, for web services, if you think about waiting times, but also we were talking about responsiveness, these are things that we have to be able to somehow understand and measure in order to avoid this uh, quality dissatisfaction and user engagement problems. But it's not only about uh, experience, but it's also about productivity. So when we talk about cloud services, interactivity and responsiveness is everything. And many people that basically rely on cloud services for working, they can severely impact uh, their own productivity because of this problem. So it's not only about uh, just uh, enjoying the things, but also making it work. So when you are having everything, let's say, in the cloud. Uh, important here is that well, we're, uh, TV... So we're about at the time limit. If you're able to sum up, that would be helpful. Yeah, okay, so uh, may maybe just one final comment here. It's not only is the network, uh, not only the services, but also the end devices are there. And maybe we can go to the next slide. So I, I uh, what do we need actually from the network? The question here is that depends on what the user perceives for specific service. So it's not only about fast connections, low latency, but it's something more holistic. And I think it's important at some point somebody said it. It's not only about quality of experience for specific services. I think it's about quality of experience for the session. Humans, we don't just react by independent small things, but we try to integrate uh, components, right? So it's very important that we take a more holistic view of saying, okay, we as a user, we have a session where the, there is the network, there are the services and devices, and we have to see how to capture these things. In a kind of single metric way, we cannot do it because the complexity is quite big. And this is why actually uh, I'm working more and advocating about using AI machine learning also into, into shedding light into all these complex things. But yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's, it's basically what I wanted to say. All right, thank you very much. Let's move to Lucas Pardue. Uh, we should ask for clarifying questions first. Yeah, I decided to skip that because we're already way over time, but okay. is there, is there a, if there's a clarifying <laughs> question, speak now. Okay, great. Let's move on. Uh, Lucas, are you there? Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Please go ahead. Brilliant. Um, thanks. So uh, this has been a great session so far. I think this this presentation is probably just going to be a reinforcement of some of the, the things we've already discussed about. So I'll keep it brief because we're kind of nearing the end of this one. Uh, the paper is is really a position on the questions that were posed by the um, by the IAB kind of invitation to this thing. And so some of the questions that piqued my interest are about, you know, should we be informing end users of metrics, whatever they might be? I think my position would be no. Um, uh, does the network, you know, corollary of this is, does the network need to know about what the applications are doing? And, and there's an argument that we put forth that says no as well. Um, so if we go into the next slide, um, th one of the premises of the document is that you know, the internet's for end users and the way that they view the internet is this box that loads of stuff happens in. It's a mess. There's different parts of it. They don't understand how it works. They want to use the internet, whatever that might be, to, to achieve their goals. And, and the goals that they want to achieve can vary by time and space. And the quality of assessment of those goals vary by people and personality. It's subjective um, and it's hard. And this system or this box is a, a complex system. And and trying to model that is incredibly difficult. And it's incredibly naive to think we can run stuff like speed test to get some metrics to to understand why maybe something was bad. Um, they're disjoint. And you know, this isn't to say the network is not irrelevant to these these things, but that the server apps and the client apps play such a large role in the ability of people to have a quality of experience that uh, the network role should not be overestimated in this, even though we're in the IAB and we're talking about networking. 
Um, so we've got two examples of users, one's happy, is one's sad. If we go on to the next example, um, the chap who uh, couldn't load the picture of his dog, you know, what's he going to think? This magic box of the internet, is it slow? Why is this happening? Is it my client? Is it my ISP? Is the server overloaded today? Is my corporate security software playing up? They're probably unlikely to blame buffer bloke because they don't know what that is. Um, they might say their mum's microwaving a potato. I don't know. Stuff happens. It changes over time. I think unless you can measure everything all of the time, um, that to, to understand why something happened in the past, uh, it's going to be difficult. Unless you can tie that to quality of experience um, and react. Like I just, I think this is too hard. Um, so most people will say, I don't care why it was bad. It was just bad, and that made me sad. And to fill out a, a, a survey at the end of this to report that it was bad doesn't fill people with happiness either, um, because quite often it's like, well, where did that report go? What me measurable outcome um, or improvement did that actually make? Um, so if we go to the final slide, um, you know, some of the points for the reason or the reason the internet was slow is because everyone else is on the internet and getting in the way and doing stuff and they shouldn't be, um, but that's life. Um, you know, in one example for me, my internet used to regularly be slow because my mum was microwaving a potato. You know, obviously that's not the internet, but my local, um, Wi-Fi or LAN or WAN or whatever you might want to call it. Uh, but this is a regular occurrence and it would knock out my interactive gaming session, um, and, and really severely disrupt me. Um, but really, you know, there's an illusion of choice there. What can I do? Uh, go out of band and speak to my mum and ask her to stop doing those things. There's not a technical measure that I could take, or there could be, I could plug into a wire. Uh, there's a diverse possibility of problems and solutions. Uh, and so measuring this stuff is hard. There's no universal frame of reference here is the position we take. Um, and there's also no grand unified means to, to combine these things together. I'd say, you know, 99% of the world's population don't know what lull is. Um, and uh, I probably just made that up right now. Uh, but it, it's something to consider of, of who we are targeting with this workshop. It's for end users. And if they don't know what we're talking about, um, let's not bombard them with, with weird metrics. Um, you could ask, does, does knowing any kind of problem help identify where it might be? Probably, I don't know. Um, or does knowing what, what theoretically you're capable of, of doing in the network help understand what is actually happening? Um, everyone wants this data, but but who's actually going to act on that to do anything? The changes are hard. They're hard to test in advance, um, and they're hard to prove in the long term because everything's changing all the time. So given a plethora of information, um, you know, what do you do? Change change your phone because someone told you that would work faster? Well, that might not even be possible. Change your ISP? Well, that's severely restricted. Um, you might identify BGP routing error and fix that, but again, um, the, the ability to control this within your own system domain is probably unlikely. And, and where, where these problems happen because of system interactions, um, I'd argue it's not necessarily uh, super helpful. And that's the end. All right. Uh, thank you. Are there any clarifying questions before we move on to the discussion? Okay, great. Well, let's move on with the discussion until the end of the hour. Uh, first up is Wes Hardiker. Uh, great. So I will remind people, please do use the Slack channel uh, when we're having a discussion. I think, you know, while the presentations are going on, it's not a big deal. But for Keith to keep track of the queue, um, let's keep the, uh, uh, the, the in WebEx chat down to just queuing, please. Um, I think, you know, that was a fantastic presentation. I think the one thing that, um, that came out of a lot of things, you know, that we've been discussing recently is that even if we have a metric, that told you you had a bad connection. It doesn't tell you why, as Vint uh, very carefully hinted in the chat and as, as a number of other people did, right? It doesn't doesn't tell you that it's the microwaved potato. It doesn't tell you that it's, you know, the router at your edge device. Uh, one of the previous questions to Vint was, you know, where is the problem? Is it this box up here for me or is it somewhere that I have no control over? Uh, so that's a really good point that we'll have to consider as this workshop goes on. Thanks. Uh, Bob Briscoe. Uh, let's move on to John Iyengar. We'll come back to Bob. Jana. Sorry, I had mute on. Shall I carry on? Sure, go for it. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, I just wanted to pick up on a point Lucas said about um, the the metrics. If it's not understood by a user, it's not worth having. And I, th I think 
that's maybe the wrong way to think about it in that if the metric is the right metric, but it's difficult for users to understand, then we have to work out a way to get them to understand or just make it a, a, a an arbitrary number that people can just compare. But it, we shouldn't use the wrong metric just because they can understand it rather than the right metric when they can't. All right, uh, John Iinger. I was actually going to say something to uh, uh, Lucas, but I'm going to say something to Lucas and also respond to Bob briefly. Um, so the the uh, I, I really love how we presented this, Lucas, and I appreciate the fact that there's an illusion of choice. And I wanted to bring this up earlier. Um, even if I know that my ISP sucks, I have very little I can do. Where I live, for example, I have exactly one ISP. So it's not just an illusion of choice. There's, I mean, there's actually very clearly no choice at all and not even an illusion as far as I'm concerned. So knowing that my ISP sucks doesn't do very much for me. Uh, it's, it's useful to some extent, but I cannot, ex I cannot uh, uh, put any economic pressure on them. So there's a fundamental problem here. And this applies not just to my ISP, but to many other things that we talk about. If we are stuck to, for example, I'm on this WebEx call as an example of this, right? Like we've agreed to do WebEx here. And so we are stuck. Potentially, we could move past that if 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 it sucks, but 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 in some cases that that just isn't an option at all. Um, to Bob, to your point, I I, I quickly want to say uh, if I could that uh, um, the right metric is I don't think the right uh, adjective to use. Well, funny enough, I'm using ironically. Um, I think what we want to talk about is the useful metric and the not so useful metric because there isn't a right or a wrong here. It's about what goal you want to accomplish and what metric will help you go towards that goal. I think it's kind of important to recognize that. I was picking up on the point about latency under load. Sorry, being, we, we, being we got to move on. Let's go to, well, okay, Bob, you're going to reply very briefly. Let's try and have a, go for it. I just did. Okay, great. Uh, let's move on to Jim Geddes. Um, our problems are end to end from the application of, to the other application on the other end of the network. You cannot solve this problem if you only look at the network. That is our experience in Linux. We've mostly fixed the problem in Linux, but there are these pesky damn device drivers. There are certain people, many of whom are on this call, I'm looking at you, Jason, who can help force things into the market by requiring that the equipment that they provide to customers, things like the pesky CPE equipment, uh, work properly. Uh, I'm thinking about Wi-Fi, where, where at least under Linux, we, uh, courtesy of Dave Tots and, and um, uh, Toki's wonderful work, we actually have working low latency Wi-Fi, um, but, the economic pressure has to be applied somehow. Right now, it's not being applied. Uh, Lucas Pardue. Uh, yeah, just, just to respond to Bob, um, I was kind of being quite glib in that talk. I hope people understood. But um, in terms of exposing metrics directly to end users, I, I see that as like the speed test of, look, here's a thing, use that number to, to kind of guesstimate how how all of the applications you ever want to run in your home and all of your family and maybe your neighbors who are stealing your Wi-Fi are going to use that metric. I don't think that's very useful. I do think what's potentially useful is is collection of end user metrics and then turning those into something that that other people can can turn into something. So you see this with the web of being able to collect um, different kinds of metrics related to web page loading, just as an example, um, that then get fed back to the service provider, say, who can then correlate that to networks and um, more longitudinal measurements to understand that, hey, for this subset of users in this population or geo, uh, they, they have a really bad page load time for some reason. Uh, they, don't, they, they know this is happening and they don't know why, and even if we told them why, they wouldn't know what to do to fix it, but that um, those metrics could help. So. Um, I'm not super pessimistic that we can't do anything. I just don't think exposing this directly as like a raw data to people is gonna gonna be that helpful. Uh, Gino Dion. Thank you. So I heard the comment about monetary pressure, and and the reality is that the the sock vendors and the CP vendors they're there. They're ready to do it. We're already doing it, and 
it's just a matter of bringing the business case. If you go to a Qualcomm or a MediaTek or Cortina and you ask them, hey, I'd like you to do this. You're going to say, okay, what's in it for me? Bring a CSP. And in order for the CSPs to be able to come to the table, they need to be able to monetize it. And that that is there. So when we talk about all these metrics and whatnot, that's not what's going to bring them to the table. What's going to bring to the table is use cases. Can I sell this to gamers? Can I sell this for people working from home? And apply those metrics into ways that the end user can relate to. And and But I can tell you, the SOC vendors, they're there. They're ready to do it. They're doing it today. It's just a matter of bringing the right messaging in the right format. Uh, Pedro Casas. Yeah, I mean, just wanted to comment on the, on the metrics. I don't know why we were talking about uh, defining metrics that the end users have to understand. I don't really think the, the end users need to understand about metrics. The end user is just about their experience. And I think what it's important to us is to understand, depending on what they are doing or what applications they are doing, what are the things that we have to measure or how do we change things in order to influence that? But I don't think from the end user perspective, you need to define new metrics to inform them because the user feels directly. Uh, Wes Hardiker. So I want to follow something that Bob uh, highlighted earlier and make sure that we emphasize it because it's something we should think about over the next couple of days, which is that a lot of the metrics that we've been talking about are really application to server. And, you know, there's a very different set of metrics for doing peer to peer uh, monitoring and things like that. Uh, you know, one of the things that we know is that BitTorrent is always faster than unicast downloads. And so, you know, that's apples and oranges to some extent due to the parallelization of, of BitTorrent. So um, uh, we, we need to not remember that everything is application to server. Uh, Bob Briscoe. Oh, yeah. Um, just coming back. On, on on what I said about Lucas and how Lucas replied, the the um, I, I think it's the sort of perfect is the enemy of the good. Just because a, a metric isn't perfect doesn't mean to say it's not useful. Just like speed test isn't perfect, but it's still useful to a lot of people. You know, witness the fact loads of people quote it and use it, and and so now when I f first looked at speed test you know, as a researcher, I thought. Yeah, okay, but you know, it's not often the actual speed across the broadband network. It might be somewhere somewhere else, you know, it might be um they're not going to their CDN or whatever. Um, but ultimately it's a good ninety percent type metric that is irrelevant in ten percent of the cases. And similarly with latency under load, which was why I picked up on Lucas's presentation at the end where he said latency under load wouldn't be understood by users. I think that, you know, from the user to a CDN is a good metric to measure how well the bits in the access network, the devices in the access network and in the in the end host and everything, so wherever it is, something isn't working if that metric is high. It's not a perfect metric, but it's good enough. Uh, Rich Brown. Uh, second call, Rich Brown. There we are, thanks. Uh, I wanted to follow up on a couple things that people said. Um, Gino, you said that the, the vendors are there, the vendors need to be sold. Um, I've been in the buffer bloat world trying to talk to vendors. They're not, they're not anxious to listen. And maybe they just think we're being the smartest guy in the room. Uh, I wanted to say I like the idea of food labels. I think uh, capacity is one characteristic and responsive is, is another. I'd want to focus on metrics that, that can go on the box for router vendors. And I'll stop there. All right. Uh, the next person in the queue is myself. So I'll try and keep myself to time, but I hope you all keep me honest. Uh, I also wanted to respond to this idea that sort of the vendors are willing to do it. Um, in my experience, so I was talking to folks at Several vendors, including you know Huawei, which makes a very large number of the eNode Bs and GNode Bs, I said, you know, why on your 4G and 5G downlinks don't you have some sort of AQM? Don't you have some sort of better queuing? And they were very frank. They said, look, um, our scheduling and traffic management is highly proprietary, and we are expecting money in exchange for changing it. Um, and you know, Facebook at one point came to us and said, we're not happy with the treatment of Facebook's traffic over the Huawei eNode Bs. There's buffer bloat. And so Facebook paid us a gigantic amount of money to set up a joint research institute. And that joint research institute researched the problem and deployed 
a custom classifier that treats Facebook's traffic preferentially on our systems. And if another vendor has a problem, we would expect them to come to us and pay us, you know, a nine figure amount of money. So I think the idea empirically that the vendors are eager to deploy AQM or eager to deploy some sort of better scheduling or queuing, it doesn't seem to be the case. It seems like they are expecting to be compensated for that by the people making money off the traffic. Uh, next person in the queue is Jim Geddes. Um, just to follow up on what you were saying, the problems are everywhere. Um, in the ENOBs, there are severe problems. These are, are not um, something that there's a magic wand to fix. Um, uh, Toki and Dave spent four, five, six years working on Linux Wi-Fi. So, but there are key points where, which, where there are costs that are sometimes hidden going on. So it's things like service calls. I, I applied service calls to my um, ISP, in this case Comcast, long before I understood what buffer bloat was. Um, there may be an education process that we can we can do to make them aware that that's part of part of what, what their support costs are. But we have to get certain organizations to to move. Um, uh, you know, we've named a fair number number of them. Uh, and the way that seems to ultimately work has to do with with money. And unless you point fingers that that your device is broken, um, it's really hard for people to vote with their feet. We need to make it really easy for those finger pointing to go on. Or we will be have a similar one of these meetings in another five or 10 years. All right, that is the end of the queue. Uh, Wes, I'll turn it over to you. All right, great. I think uh, this morning was uh, a great set of discussions. Um, you know, we we set this workshop up knowing it would be somewhat uh, chaotic, and uh, the the introduction sections that we we did this morning, and we'll continue after a short break, <clears throat> are really designed to sort of frame the problem. And this is sort of exactly what we've been doing: is, is sort of scoping out how hard it is. And as the workshop goes forward, I think we'll find more. Uh, people that think they might have a solution toward things. So uh, with that, um, thanks for everybody that's joined the Slack channel. It's growing nicely. Um, and thanks for everybody that has uh, participated nicely. And thank you to Keith for doing a great job of uh, moderating a, a very rapid session queue. That's not an easy thing to do. So uh, with that, I'm out of espresso and I'm going to go fix that problem. So we have 10 minutes and we will see you at 10 minutes after the hour where we'll pick up with introductions number two. Thank you. You should stay on the line, just don't. <laughs>
Uh, Ahmed, just as a note, um, I'll I'll be running the slides for this next section, so I can click through them for you. Hello. Hello. Yeah, there's yeah. This is Tommy. I'll I'll be, I'll be running the slides for the next section because I, I, I see. Just, can I email you the slides then? I, I, I have point? them already. The the, the the latest version. Uh, when was the latest version updated? I sent them yesterday. Yep, yep, I, I should have those then. Uh, let, me, let me just check the verb, version one or five. I, I have a combined deck, but it, it looks the same as what you have there. Uh, uh, um, yeah, it's your five. Um, how many slides are there in the deck? Should be seven. Seven. We're we're putting all the slides together to make sure that there's not a delay in switching between people. So the uh, the session yeah. manager, which will be Tommy next round, will will uh, take I'm, care I'm, of it. I tell you what, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm at your mercy, so I'm gonna um, let you in control. But I'm gonna try and whiz through them very quickly to to respect the time. That's all. That that is great. Thank you.
All right, we're a good 10 seconds out, so I'll turn it over to Tommy, who's going to run sort of the, the session for the last uh, next next two hours. Thank you, Tommy, for doing that, and it's uh, all yours. Absolutely. All right, so um, we are in the second half of our introduction section, so this will be for the next uh, hour. We'll have three short presentations, um, again, five minutes with about two minutes of clarification questions, and then half an hour of discussion. And so we are starting out with Ahmed. All right, so please feel free to go ahead and let me know when to advance the slides. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, or where you are. Um, I work for the um, UK uh, uh, telecom regulator of COM, so I won't go through um, what this discussion is about is in the title. Next slide, please. Um, I think historically um, the operators uh, and the network engineers have had their requirements for measurements. Regulators have a slightly different. Um, we are concerned about making sure consumers have access to a wide range of information and can run applications if you're a cap and also ensuring that, that they have a good choice, a good wide choice. Uh, of content online. One thing that, that uh, the regulators seem to think about, especially in Europe, is around the universal service directive. And, and, and so it's around, it's around being able to provide a minimum of quality of service to support uh, end applications. Um, next slide, please. Um, what it's about for us, it's about the access network. It's the black, it's the black line that connects the end user um, with the rest of the internet, from a from a from a consumer perspective, what we see is that the consumer needs for transparency. They need to know what, what they're getting, how good it is, is it are they getting value for money, that kind of thing. From a policymaker perspective, it's around the notion of understanding the national infrastructure, how good it is, is it fit for purpose, and and and, and sort of investment in in the infrastructure to maintain sort of quality. And availability of, of connectivity uh, so for years to come. Um, one aspect that's important for us from uh, uh, which the internet is able to do is allow sort of uh, innovation without permission, which is, which is important from a regulatory perspective. Two risks that, that, that have been highlighted over the years. One of the degradation of internet access as a service as a whole, as the side of the pipe, and also targeting specific applications for degradation. Next slide, please. Um, I won't, I won't talk much about this slide other than from a requirement point of view. Two, perhaps, perhaps uh, two things that, 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 that's different from, from operators and, and, and engineers, and that's comparability and trustworthiness. And trustworthiness is quite important for us because sometimes we do need to defend our decisions in court, which means that, that the measurements themselves, the measurement systems, the methodologies, and so on has a legal value. So designing a system in that perspective might be different from designing a system, say, for example, for a, a, a performance measurement. Um, the other the, the other points I think are quite, are quite clear. Next, next slide, please. Um, over the years, um, I've done a lot of work with Beric, that's the, um, Europe, the, the body for European regulators for electronic communications, the umbrella for all the European regulators this is before the UK left uh, Europe. I mean, a lot of work uh, trying to understand uh, some of the systems like RIBE, Atlas, MLAB, and other commercial um, uh, systems. Uh, we also looked at LMAP and IPPM, which are in the ITF, of course. Um, and, 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 and what we found was that all systems were good, but they didn't quite fit our, the regulatory requirement in one way or the other. Um, Beric eventually um, embarked on building uh, a system. Uh, I don't know how far that got to. I was involved in the specifications. I know for sure that we drew a lot of um, material from the LMAP architecture and IPPM as well. But one thing that perhaps uh, I would like to highlight here is the rising star in this in this uh, in this game. And that's crowdsource because of opening a new insight into the experience of people and also the networks themselves. However, there, are lacks, there is a lack of standards in the space. Privacy issues are, are prevalent as well. Um, and the collection of data 
and and and, and isn't isn't future proof we are still at the mercy of the operating system vendors sometimes some of the information is made available sometimes not available and so on next slide please um I won't talk about the quality of service <laughs> metrics. This is this is bread and butter for you guys, and certainly for us, and has been for for years, and it will continue to be. Um, but I think I think it isn't just about metrics, as we found. It's metrics plus how to measure the methodology for measurement, and also the software implementation of those methodologies. That's what we found. You can have the same metric being measured in two different ways and get different answers. Quality of experience is becoming more and more important. It's in the discussions today. Um, there's been a suggestion that it's difficult. However, um, we still see commercial companies who are uh, selling quality of experience systems for a nominal fee. Um, we think, or I think, that there's a sort of common theoretical framework uh, that, that needs to be worked out here of some sort. Um, also, of course, like a standardization um that's that's absolutely prevalent next slide please so i'm at your um, out of time uh i'm just just one on the last slide yeah um so i, I, I will go back to talk about the quality of, of experience um delta q will be discussed later in the week um that could be from the basis for um uh, for a theoretical uh, framework but i think it might need to take a bit, a bit further standardization we talked about and also i think the future for this game because we need a lot of data uh, to make them to, to make the measurements meaningful and that is around standardization common software implementations and also common data formats and apis with that uh, i would like to say thank you for inviting me and listening to me thank you all right thank you um if anyone has a clarifying question you can jump in for 30 seconds All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, next up, we have Michael. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. As you saw, a case for long-term statistics. This is about being passive and measuring different things. Uh, ties well, I think, with the requests from others to look at applications. And I think it's maybe a bit redundant regarding uh, what Lucas has been presenting before. So. Um, Quality metrics, I mean, uh, one of the things we can do with them, at least, is uh, as a user, you know, to, to have some long-term fix to problems. Uh, change the ISP, change equipment, well, change the application is probably not in this list here, but could have been telling people in the household to stop using some other application. Um, and that isn't helped much by uh, a case of somebody sitting and doing a ping delay. And I would say even also running something like an RPM test. I mean, you run it, you test it, but it doesn't help you. At, at the time you run it, it may have been, it may be totally too late already. You're busy using an application. You can't do the test in parallel. So uh, my case here is against such interactive use, not saying this is useless to have, but it would be more useful perhaps to have more passive measure measurements. Next slide, please. Uh, so useful metrics as examples would be, is my connection the bottleneck? How often is it in general? Or was it the bottleneck five minutes ago during a telco that I just have? Uh, do applications influence each other? This question of, you know, uh, is there really a problem if somebody's doing something in parallel? Um, I, I, okay, I, yeah, make this a bit more lively with the story. Should, should fit in, I hope. I have a friend in Austria whom I, I play table tennis with, actually. Living, I live in Norway, so we use this Oculus Quest headset. Crazy thing. I move around in my home space and everything. And it shows on a screen on the side, it shows uh, ping delay in milliseconds. So you play, you see 20, 30 milliseconds. All of a sudden, delay goes up to 200, 300. What happens is that he says, oh, 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 it's getting, you know, he's losing points. So he just takes off the headset. I hear him shout at his family. <laughs> he comes back, he said, oh, that's obvious. They were watching video. Can't work at the same time, of course. And I wonder, I mean, of course, right? It depends. It, it, does he know it really is his network? It seems to work. Yes, <laughs> it seems to make the difference. But, you know, did he just tell them in vain that they should stop watching video? Is, is that the right way to use the network? It's all very awkward. Uh, next. 
So I do think there is something we can do. Um, I think passive listening can work as long as this is associated with applications. Uh, I looked at the wireless diagnost diagnostics tool in OS X, which I think is very nice actually for what it offers. It's, it's pretty much in the direction of what I'd like to see, but it's not doing, it's not showing per application traffic. And um, it will be about gathering some other long-term statistics, just like packet loss, RTT growth. Did it really happen on my side? Did it happen, you know, was it on my bottleneck? You could be doing pings with TTL limits, things like that, right? To uh, find out which applications were involved. Did they, you know, did they share a bottleneck? We made a mechanism some time ago on passive shared bottleneck detection. For WebRTC, that mechanism, as far as I know, is not implemented by anybody because it's complex. <laughs> uh, it uses one-way delay, but there are many variants of doing bottleneck detection in um, in research, more or less reliable, all kinds of ways of doing it. I'm just saying we could be doing measurements of that nature and get more out of it, and then you could be having a more educated guess on whether it was the potato in the microwave or something else. That's it for me. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any clarifying questions? All right, sounds like not. We will be able to discuss this later in our time. All right, thank you. And next up we have Joachim. Can I speak? There we go. Uh, can you please advance to the next slide? Yeah, so I'm going more into the technical details in particular. So my personal expectation, if I was to rate a network quality first term would be service connectivity, including all of the associated protocols of a service. And then I'd rate the quality as if it underperforms, matches or exceeds my user expectations, which are subjective, of course. Then I'd rate, if I do measurements, I uh, infer on a time frame. That is, do I evaluate past network quality, the current network quality, or do I anticipate future network quality or service quality? In this context, I just mentioned repeatability and continuity to terms of the IP performance metrics framework that have been questioned by RFC 7312. I'm searching for a um, metric that can be used to evaluate and compare results and, and perhaps also automate it. Uh, in theory, it sounds pretty straightforward. So we have connectivity, delays, jitter, losses, transfer capacities, existing RFCs that we put together, glue together somehow. We try to exhibit no bias for specific operators and technologies and uh, try to put some simple metric together. Unfortunately, it's not that simple for, for two specific reasons. Next slide, please. Um, in the first uh, thing, and this, this is what Jana already said, so using users experience service quality and not network quality. How, first question is how can we differentiate between these two? And the second aspect is that services define the network traffic pattern. Users configuration options on how these services use the network is, are very limited. And the user behavior the service use, the expectations, and the traffic patterns differ on societies, cultures, geographies, age groups, tariffs. So it's, it's difficult to capture all of these in one metric. Um, why is this important? Networks today are no stateless copper wires. And unfortunately, many quality of experience models today, quality of service models, infer on, uh, rely on networks being stateless copper wires with a linear behavior. Networks react statefully to user traffic at various layer increase in starting with physical and, and uh, transport layer, et cetera, schedulers allocate and deallocate capacities. And we have a huge number of uncertainty factors that goes even down to the content and compressibility of packets. If we go to capture, we have privacy concerns, so GGPR, et cetera. Uh, just as an example at the right to become technical, we have uh, uh, delays, one-way delays in the uplink of a 3G network. Random payload sizes, packet sent at random start times. And depending on how these packets aggregate together, 
we see that the user behavior differs for a six-fold scale, so depending from, from 25 milliseconds to 150 milliseconds, just depending on how these packets, these random packets aggregate together. So this is user experience and difficult to capture for random traffic. Next slide, please. So if we now are now thinking about the quality measurement framework, first I would say we must define the requirements for this network quality rating. Who is the audience? End user operator automation. Do we want to do an SLA verification? Should it be an actionable item that the network accepts? Do we target the past, the present, or the future? Do we have specific requirements with respect to accuracy? And can we ignore the services? We're opening Pandora's box, I'd say, when we evaluate certain services, but I think we cannot do without. One option would be to, to define services that offer, offer a model, an abstract network profile description that includes, for instance, protocols, network traffic patterns, and requirements. How can we capture user input? That's for discussion. And networks are instrumented to monitor. We have heard already about LMAP. Uh, can we extend it to the service profile? But uh, simplicity is something else. So how, how can we uh, convey this to non-technical users? And, and uh, I agree with most of the participants so far that we, it, I, I don't see a way to map network quality to one single value. We have orthogonal metrics that represent quality and, and it's quite difficult. Yeah. On the next slide, I have just for completeness some, some, uh, some uncertainty factors. I try to structure them, but um, yeah. That's, uh, oh, that's the first slide. Oh. Okay, one slide. Yeah, it, one it more slide, please. Like, yeah. Okay, it, it has been stripped. Okay, it's it's fine. Yeah. Uh, okay, it, it was just I, I tried to structure uncertainty factors that goes. All all of these measurements have been done in a static fashion, meaning uh, no movement, no redundant paths, no uh, redundant aggregated paths uh, having distinct technologies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have so many uncertainty factors in this game that it becomes rather difficult to capture the behavior. So I'm skeptical, but I'm, I'm very keen on doing these discussions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, any clarifying questions on that before we jump into discussion? All right, seems like not. Let me stop sharing this and our queue is open. So I'll just preface this discussion with, you know, we've, this is sort of the end of the uh, introduction section, which is uh, important to note that we've sort of tried to frame the problem in, in the beginning of this workshop. So, uh, you know, any, any thoughts on, on continuing that in terms of how we can work forward in the rest of the workshop for solving all of the problems that we've been talking about this morning. Um, I found a number of interesting points in the last couple of, of uh, slide decks, including, you know, finding out which applications it, it actually affected the metric that you just measured is a really challenging thing, let alone the privacy aspects of, of doing that as well is uh, sort of fascinating to worry about, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, Anna? Yeah, I was just thinking about your last comment there, Joachim, that, that you, you're pessimistic. There are so many things that influence uh, the measurements, and, and this is clear. Uh, but I guess we have to be aware that no matter what, what metric we pick here, it's, it's not going to be perfect, and we're not going to be able to measure it perfectly. So maybe we need to have something that's good enough and measurable so that it is useful, but it's it's never going to be perfect, I think. <clears throat> um, just, just as a note to the people uh, raising their hand in WebEx, we're using the chat queue, so please uh, do the plus queue in the chat rather than raising your hand. Um, Torlis? So uh, for the first presentation, I mean, um, I, th I think it would be interesting to really understand, you know, what, what type of metrics might be useful for regulation. And so I think in the past, there was a lot of, you know, let's say the um, degree of over um, 
subscription of of bandwidth, right? So, oh, you'll get 16 megabit DSL link, but sorry, yeah, we've got a 10 megabit uplink and we've got 1000 people on it, but hey, it's a 16 megabit DSL service, right? So may not be as an end to end uh, service be very relevant, but for the actual bandwidth you're getting, it is very relevant. And so what are, you know, examples of metrics we've seen being regulated um, and what might be, you know, uh, better metrics to be regulated in the future? Uh, so, in terms of metrics for regulation, I'm not sure whether the um, the existing legislation mentions speed or latency or or jitter or anything like that. Not from memory, um, I think it possibly it helps if we separate this into two areas. One, um, if you like, the demand side, uh, which is what applications require to work. Uh, and then the supply side, which is what the network can do to deliver that demand. Yeah, so that's the supply side. And I think if we thought in terms of those two buckets, it might help kind of like decompose the problem and simplify the problem a little bit. Uh, so from a, uh, from, a, from a bucket one, which is about the applications, really, I think some of the things that we talked about uh, things like, uh, you know, uh, fridge quality, thumb up, thumb down, simple, simple metrics that people, that ordinary people can understand. Um, and, and, and you want to, be, to make that as far away from technology, from, from, from details, of, of, of technical details. From the supply um, side, I think that could be a technical, um, mm -hmm. technical metrics, like the ones we play with these days. Ahmed, and, and, um, and that's really fine. Excuse me, yeah, so we're, we're limiting the comments to one minute at a time. Uh, so you can jump back in queue. Wes? Yeah, so, um, and re even speakers should be in the queue as well. So um, uh, I, I actually find one big concern of, of the recent discussions about politics and, and regulations is that they can actually affect the definition of metrics, right? I think a lot of us are technical geeks and we might define what we believe is right and true. And then, you know, you get lawyers that need to frame it in terms of politics and then you end up with, um, you know, companies that want to influence that and how you measure it. There was a fantastic, interesting discussion on Nanog a while back about high-speed internet and should we redefine what that means? And there was a large number of people from major telco end user providers that said, no, the current definition is fast enough. We should not touch that number, even though it hasn't been touched in 10 years. You can guess why they wanted to argue for not touching it. Uh, Dave. Sorry, you're talking about Dave Tot. Okay, am yes. I hearing it? Great. You so go. to touch upon to touch upon the previous comment, um, packet loss is good. Measuring those packet loss and markings is good, and it is a should be a forcing feedback function into what overall arching demands are made for more bandwidth. In my opinion, what the world does not need is more bandwidth; it needs better bandwidth. And if there was some level of some set of economic factors and forcing functions that would lead to a long-term ability to more dynamically upgrade our devices in place, including new metrics, et cetera, we would be able to cut the tail of development and deployment, so development and standardization to deployment from the current nine years or so down to something that would more dynamically uh, reflect conditions of the internet today. All right, thank you. Uh, back to Ahmed. Um, just, just to pick on that, um, really the, the, the regulators um, have been reporting on speed mainly, and that's because of the market. Uh, the market at the moment are selling connections you know, per speed kind of thing. There is no compelling reason why we wouldn't move to another metric if the market shifted or if it provided more information to consumers. Um, but I think, I think as, a, as a suggestion to, to the community here, standardization does need, uh, does play a, a role and also representation um, of, 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 of the real experience would, would also play a, play a big role in us accepting uh, sort of new metrics. Uh, metrics. 
And I, I just want to emphasize from our experience, it isn't just the metric, it's the metric, it's how it's measured. And in, in some cases we've seen even the way it's implemented in hardware and software makes a difference. All right, thank you. Uh, Neil. I'm just to pick up on what Ahmed said, I think there's, there are, in engagements that we've had with people, there is a wider interest because the, di the digital supply chain is getting more, involving more and more, uh, you know, you have uh, GPON providers who are separate from wholesale providers who are separate from this, who are separate from that. Um, there is a, a, a great interest in holding uh, your supplier's feet to the fire. If you could just define the size of the feet or what fire they have to put them against, right? So I think that the one is regulation, but I think there's a large um, untapped demand for uh, enforceable um, SLAs that have uh, that could be potentially enforced uh, uh, in an appropriate court. So I think I think there's there's two ways of looking at this. It's not just regulation. I think uh, follow the money uh, is another way of potentially doing this. Uh, Kanjiro? Yes. Uh, my concern about policy making is uh, regulators are trying to employ speed tests to provide information to consumers. So once it's you know, widely accepted by consumers, it becomes a little bit too late to fix the problem. So we need to propose something better than speed tests before you know it becomes too late that's it back to neil uh, actually our experience has been that by defining the speed tests um the notion of speed the speed tests become gained right and you know once upon a time it was a single tcp session we know physical hardware devices that use 24 concurrent tcp sessions to get the speed up thereby hiding all of the loss that they've created uh, in the buffers, right, to try and get the speed up. So I think the, the other thing, you, you need an evil uh, persona to look at these things, to understand how they are going to be gamed and stop those, get that gaming occurring if you can. Ahmed? Um, so, um... I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a glass half, half full. Uh, kind of guy, so I, want, I, I don't know nothing about gaming, but I think I think maybe we need to start to change in the way we design systems, protocols, and try to think about uh, performance by design or performance measurement by design. You know, as a network engineer many years ago, I used to sit down and work out what what what, what the latency per TCP uh, session was. Well, could 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 the the communicating and themselves work that uh, by themselves and make that information available as part of the operating system? I think I think that would be a, a great help, um, for, you know, for protocol designers to think about what are the key metrics here for this particular protocol and how how I can make it available as part of the protocol design. Stuart. Neil made a really good comment there, which I wanted to reinforce. Uh, any test we make is going to be gamed by people looking to optimize that score, and we have to accept that. So we should keep that in mind when defining a test. Ideally, we want to test. Like if we had a test that is consistent low delay, regardless of any traffic pattern, then any provider who games the system to give consistently low delay, regardless of any traffic pattern, I don't care that they're gaming the system. They've, they've done what I wanted. And that's a good test. What one, one way of gaming the test is actually the same as the outcome we're trying to get. Yeah, makes sense. All right, uh, Toki. Yeah, I was going to make the same point Stuart just made that it, it's about creating a test where gaming it drives the performance that you want to have. Hey, I didn't hear you. Sorry, no uh, Because of latency. <laughs> yeah. Seems like it. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I I have a I have a very concrete suggestion upon uh, that is related to Ahmed's comment about about um, uh, statistics that should be stored by in in in, in the OS or offered. Um, I think I get a lot of very interesting statistics about, for instance, TCP with this com netstat command that I can use on my Apple machine that shows me all these things of packet losses and ECN marks and whatever has been used in the past. One thing that I would love to have there would be to see if uh, or how often congestion avoidance has been entered. Because I think that is a major part of the problems that we're in fact discussing here. Because very often we're just having slow start and connections terminate and we don't even ever enter congestion avoidance. And that will make all the difference in uh, what metrics matter and what really constitutes a form of congestion or issue or problem in our network, because it could be just more like collisions, you know, randomly people appearing and slow starting altogether or not. <laughs> I think that thank is you. often the case. Yeah. All right. Time's up. Um, thank you. Neil? I, I was just going to pick up on Ahmed's uh, thing about this gaming. Um, it, other projects, large scale projects I've worked with where games were, where gaming was a potential financial um, upside. Um, game theorists are very useful in this process um, because actually, so I think there are ways in which we could look at how this could be gained and the economic resources, and analyze it, and go and find a friendly game theorist to make sure we're, we're not, we're not, um, you know, we're doing the right thing. Omar. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, it seems to me that we are uh, currently discussing two types of metrics, the a priori metrics, which will uh, define how the system will behave uh, versus posteriori metrics that uh, are uh, strongly correlated with good, uh, good uh, experience uh, without uh, explaining how this uh, is happening. I just wanted to to share this observation, maybe it can become more useful, maybe not. That's my observation. Thank you. Thank you. Ahmed? Um, from a regulatory perspective, you know, we, we, we are not network engineers. You know, we're not trying to solve network problems for, 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 for the operators. Um, in fact, if we tried, we probably we, we, we will get it wrong. You know, they they are the best at, at running the networks. Really, from our point of view, we we, we want to report the right thing to, to consumers, um, subject to their contract, subject to their um, being able to choose the right package in, in the future, switching that kind of thing. Uh, and 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 from from that national statistics point of view, about you know sort of the the, delicate, the health. Of the national tele telecom infrastructure, um, on the gaming side, I would have thought you couldn't game. Uh, you wouldn't improve the performance of your network if you were uh, if you were going to game. You can only reduce the the, the the capacity of your network or, or or increase the latency. So I wouldn't have thought why gaming would take a place. But I, I'm not hey. practitioner anymore, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, out of time. Uh, back to Wes. All right. So, um, a number of interesting uh, comments. I think this discussion has been fascinating. Um, uh, I, I have one story to tell, which is that my son recently had to work with his internet service provider, a network engineer, who came out and uh, refused to use his own company's measurement system because they know it was gamed and and you know was actually using different things when trying to diagnose my son's uh, apartment complex. Um, but I'd love to hear people's thoughts on going back to the privacy aspect. Uh, we sort of glossed over that, and that seemed like an important one. Does anybody have thoughts of how do we safely define a metric system that actually accurately measures stuff without at the same time revealing that, you know, they're uh, going to some particular website or is playing some particular, you know, service and game or something like that? Anybody have thoughts on that? Right, Neil. Um, I'm, I would encourage you to come and see what we have to say on Thursday, because actually, I, mean, I had to say that, didn't I? Um, because basically, it's possible to insert random uh, measurement 
instruments such that they don't reveal. You can't, it doesn't reveal what was actually being done in terms of which websites are being done, at least at the network level. I mean, obviously, if you can see the headers, you capture the headers, but it's not necessary to capture the headers um, per se in order to be able to do this, these, the, these measurements. Yeah, all right, looks like Jana is no longer in queue. Um, Torless. I think the more you get up to the quality of experience metric, the uh, less privacy you'll have, right? I mean, if you don't want to unveil whether you're doing, um, you know, video streaming with a 30 second play out or um, uh, web browsing where you want to have the shortest round trip time to see all the wonderful ads, just to give the two classic examples, right? Uh, then, um, well, you won't get good quality experience metrics for these two applications. You can still get the lower layer network metrics that uh, will keep everything, you know, like round trip time and throughput and all these good things. But uh, yeah, that's when you how you keep privacy. Ahmed? Um, I was just going to say that, that there are some encouraging work in the IETF, I think, which is about having servers in the network that says something about the quality of service that, that the network is, is is able to provide at that particular moment in time. I suppose there's going to be some types of a time window. So while we um, so far have spoken about over the top type of measurements, um, the, the networks themselves do have rich information. And if those could be made available, that would that would be really, really helpful. And I think the ITF does have the mechanism for doing that. I think it needs more, more thinking and more um, sort of um, theoretical basis for any work to, do, to, to push that work forward. Matt. Yes, uh, one of my visions for measurement, and I, I hate to admit how far this goes back this goes, has been on is always on measurement in the serving, and to have ways of exposing um, metrics that the content provider has of the path, and I, I have to admit I gravitate towards that kinds of measurements, and I, I actually can touch on that a little bit in my talk. Um, there are some applications that do this. They are hampered by a lack of standardization, a lack of, of consistent language. And going back to the uh, food uh, um, labeling, you can imagine standardizing some of the rows in such a label in a nutrition label and having an ISP being able to say in standard agreed upon nutrition lang language, your network doesn't have enough protein or whatever it is it needs to say. And and that actually being useful information to the user and useful information backed up by measurements that can be done in multiple ways, useful information to the provider. Thank you. Alexander? Yeah, so yeah, I just wanted to comment uh, also on the privacy aspect. And basically I, I have two, two comments there. One thing is basically, uh, perhaps not all measurements need to be uh, passive measurements, but also there's a role for active measurements, right? Active measurements are one way, I think, to address some of the privacy aspects where you have synthetic um, <clears throat> uh, synthetic traffic and so forth. Obviously, the question is what does it say about your production traffic and so forth, but uh, it depends on the purpose here. It, it, I, I do think actually it has its place, particularly when you want to assess the, the general quality and so forth. And when it's and also when you don't use this for accounting purposes, the data, then of course you would have to measure and observe the the actual service levels and so forth. And the second aspect concerns um, also with regards to to the uh, to the privacy aspect is perhaps there's a role not only for measurement but also for prediction, or where you basically measure one set of uh, metrics. Um, which are not directly what you want to do, but from which you can uh, essentially uh, where you measure one set of metrics that do not reveal the privacy, but from which you can make certain predictions and statements about what the quality uh, of experience and so forth that that, that, that you are experiencing. Okay. And uh, so there's a lot of work also actually on, on the on the prediction side, which I think can be useful here. Thank you. All right, I'll, I've put myself in queue uh, just. Another quick comment on the privacy aspect, um, you know, particularly as we look at things, you know, uh, using quick, or as we start having more encrypted 
TLS client to those, there's going to be a lot less visibility of the networks. And so I, I want to kind of pause it out here that as we are gathering these measurements, um, thinking about the client's role in, you know, getting the various measurements either passively or actively and aggregating them in a way that it could export the data meaningfully to have uh, a good summary without revealing specifically what was being accessed, I think would be an interesting um, exercise. So it's not only how do we do the measurements and how can a client understand it when a client operating system is in a position where it can know the full browsing history, but how can it share that without um, divulging too much about what the user was doing? All right, Yari. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and sort of following up on what Tommy said, and I agree with everything that he said, but I want to expand on that just a little bit because the, the basic setup is that we have multiple parties. I mean, there's the endpoints, there's some network components in different parts of the network. There's some test equipment and probes and, uh, and, and, and so on. And uh, I don't view the privacy problem as unsolvable. You just have to be careful when you design the, the system that, that uh, you know, what information you share, you don't have to share everything. Um, that, that's not, not the point and I don't, we're not in that world anymore, but you have to share something if, if you actually want to get, um, get sort of uh, full measurement functionality, at least like being able to figure out like where the problem is and not just the end to end result, or if you want to get uh, more always on measurements and so on. So you have to have to work together but you don't need to share everything. You just have to, have to decide what you share and, and to who. You also don't have to share to everybody. You share, uh, share to a particular direction. Thank you. Ahmed? Um, Ahmed, if you're speaking, I can't hear you. Sorry, I was I was I was on on mute. Uh, so for, on the privacy side, I can't agree any any more than what's being said. All research, all our research shows that privacy is a is an important element in, in on our consumers' thoughts. And, and Tommy, you were bang on. I think I think you were echoing what I was saying, and that is uh, revealing um, uh, sort of performance uh, measures should be part of the protocol design and the system design at birth and not know that as an aftermath. I'm just going to pick up on the server side uh, measurements, which Matt, I think, was talking about. I am aware of one one system that does that. So all the work is done from the server side, very little on the client side. And there are there are merits in that. And you know, if you think about mobile, battery, that sort of thing, uh, there is that angle, of course, uh, which was the, the server side measurements is a cl claims or that can be does claim that is better for in the mobile case. The other point I want to be sort of active versus passive. Um, there are reports right, we're, know, we're from at, we're the measurement time. community. Sorry, I'll come back to that later yeah. when you don't, want don't, to okay. this time. <laughs> All right, Robin, you're up. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, so um, I want to echo what, what Tommy said is, is a bit quick. It becomes more difficult to do in network stuff and so the project I've been working on is called QLog, uh, which we'll also present on tomorrow, which the idea is that we log everything on the endpoints, client servers, and then we aggregate across the different layers. And we also have privacy questions there. And then um, what we hope indeed is, is something like what Tommy says, is that we can aggregate uh, as, uh, a lot of these logs together if we want to share them with, let's say, uh, service providers for observability. But another approach that we had in mind was to define or standardize uh, privacy levels to say, if you have obfuscation level 15, then this is what you should strip or you should obfuscate. But uh, in, in some use cases, you still want to have some identifiable information, if it, even if it's just IPs or just some uh, um, URLs. So I think like a, a sliding scale, a sliding privacy scale might be a, an interesting approach there. Thank you. Uh, Omer. Uh, yeah, regarding privacy, I just wanted to uh, meant to comment that privacy is not a static game. And uh, if we are assuming that bad players exist, uh, it's probably would be uh, 
prudent to assume that they will continuously uh, extend their methods. And therefore, if we are thinking about uh, including privacy into measurements, probably it would be great to think of how to update the privacy measures and how to not uh, to ossify something that works today, but will be uh, will be naive and irrelevant in five years from now. Thank you. Uh, uh, case in point, Wikimedia Foundation. Sorry. Yeah. Jana. Thanks, Tommy. Um, so I uh, appreciate that it's it, the, the conversation has been great so far. I should know that first. Um, I think it's really useful to think about how to share metrics, how to gather metrics and aggregate them. And all of that is very useful to, to the specific point that Tommy made. There is a PPM mailing list uh, at the IETF. There's probably going to be an effort sometime at IETF 112 on trying to do something exactly like that. So uh, 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 keep on the lookout for that. I also want to note uh, yet again, harping on my, hey, applications already exist on the network uh, uh, thing. There are applications that already exist. Vendors already exist. We aren't doing this for the first time. It's been done and it continues to be used. Metrics, there's a lot of people already measuring the network in a lot of ways. So one, one way in which I can see us uh, uh, maybe doing some sanitization help or work here might be to actually uh, help or encourage vendors to share metrics that they're already gathering about networks for their particular applications. Uh, figure out how to share them uh, privately, figure out how to share them with all the privacy controls in place and how to aggregate those bits of information. That'll be very useful. There's data already sitting there. We just need to gather it. Thank you. All right. We are at time. Ahmed is in queue and I'll just make a comment. We're going to move on to the next set of sessions at the hour. So if you have a couple more comments, we have room for maybe one or two more. Ahmed, go ahead. Um, just on the active uh, versus passive, I put a comment in the chat, but that doesn't mean uh, there is no room for the passive or the active. I think there are room for both uh, in, 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 the, in the toolbox. Each one uh, is important for something and perhaps not the other. In terms of aggregating data from different measurement systems, this is just picking up on Jana. The important thing is that when, when you aggregate data from different places, it needs to be harmonized and comparable. Um, each measurement system will have its own bias and its own. This is why I was talking about um, metrics, uh, method of measurements, and also down to the software uh, that type of implementation. And that's something we have we have we have seen very much so. Thank you, um, Robin. Go ahead. If there's time, I wanted to come back to Jana and. He also said that at the beginning in this talk, I think, uh, and it's a point I'm trying to make tomorrow as well, that bigger companies should share more data. Uh, the real thing is that I am not personally convinced that they are currently not doing this purely out of privacy uh, considerations, right? I don't think privacy there is the big issue or the big problem or, or something that we cannot solve. I think there are deeper issues at stake there. So do we need other incentives for uh, the big coast to share their real application metrics in in any privacy sensitive form uh, would would be my real question uh, now or tomorrow all right i think that looks like a good end to that first session so um, uh, lots of good discussion there i i have been taking little tiny notes of of major things that i'm hearing out of you know all of this discussion um, and that bullet list is actually getting quite long, so I, I appreciate all the thoughts. Uh, I think with that, we'll roll into metrics, right? And so the, the beginning was all problem framing, and we're going to start getting into more concrete uh, stuff, I think, after this. All right, and I think first up we have Matt. Hello. Gee, if I had had all this framing, I would have done things slightly differently, but we'll, we'll, we'll go with this. Um, next slide, please. Uh, about two months ago, I first encountered the Apple responsiveness uh, developer tool. And I actually, it was a video presentation uh, shown uh, in connection with one of Dave Tott's buffer bloat um, RPM meetings that he's currently been running. 
And there was a whole bunch of things that the responsiveness metric does that um, I think are, proved, are going to prove to be very, very important in this space. Um, I assume everybody has seen it, but it's basically the rate at which TCP, at which the network delivers rounds of, of information. The nice thing about this metric, one of the nice things about it, or a bunch of nice things about it, um, you can construct a concrete definition of it, and there are parallel metrics at different layers in the stack. Um, I happen to be focusing on a TCP layer definition. Uh, the Apple tool actually measures an application layer definition, and they are different because they include different phenomena, but underneath, they're, they're driven by the same principle. The nice thing about it is you can define them concretely in terms of wire packets on the wire. And so there's a very concrete definition that's sort of abstract. It doesn't depend on technology, or well, at least the, the transport layer doesn't depend much on technology at all. Um, and you can talk about measurements that are, uh, you can calibrate the measurements against the reality that you can determine, for instance, from packet cap captures. Um, for this preliminary study, because I didn't have the data readily available, um, what I'm using to estimate the rounds is the final value of the smooth RTT estimator. We have, um, and measurement lab has 12 years of archived 10 millisecond samples of the smooth RTT data for all of the tests. And I believe it's all intact, although I haven't confirmed that. Next slide. So um, the the responsive methods that I'm using is is what I would like to use is the is actually accumulated rounds, which you can measure during a test. Um, and I believe that we can both com compute this for all of our archive data. We could also imagine comp computing it inside of the NDT measurement tool. It's, it's actually just a telemetry change. It's not a code change or a wire format change. Um, and I also believe that it'll turn out that responsiveness in today's internet is a direct predictor of page load time for the vast majority of web pages. The constraints are if most of the objects run out of data before you're out of slow start, so before they receive a congestion signal, and most of the compute to invoke the next, to, to load additional objects is fairly small, the network responsiveness determines the time to load each object, and the application responsiveness determines the time to invoke su successive objects. And given that those might be dominated entirely by the network delay, um, I would hope that responsiveness will turn out to be a direct measurement of page load times. So I'm going to show some baby pictures. Next slide. This is uncalibrated data. Un unclean data is just completely raw data from the final responsiveness. This is all of the connections over 12 years that use the servers in, in New York City. And it's shown as three discontinuous graphs because it turns out that it's sensitive to TCP implementation. And the, the big discontinuity is the three different colors are using three different versions of TCP. And uh, in New York, uh, Cubic and Reno look similar. In other geos, they don't, which is actually something we haven't explored. Um, there's a, lot of, a whole lot of caveats about this graph, um, which, um, I will eventually get to. Um, I'm actually more interested in the plumbing to produce the graphs and make sure the data is correct than actually studying the graphs. I want to encourage you to go look at the paper. There's a link in the paper to a collab document um, which contains uh, the source code to generate these graphs. This graph took about 20 seconds to plot the proper subset of 4 billion measurements. Um, and next slide. This is the same data with a slightly different query. This is also in the, in the published document. This is split by ISP. Um, it, it, uh, this one says like test volume. I actually changed it. It's the ISPs with the most clients. The downward slope circa January 2020 is actually the version change for the platform. And there's a discontinuity in the data because the platform changed um, uh, at that point, but the upward slope is real, and there's sort of a sort of a trivial question: which ISPs are paying attention to responsiveness? And you can see it in this data. And anybody who wants to run this data for their geo needs to write one line of SQL in the 
in the notebook and can play with it. Next slide. So a bunch of things on my to-do list. Um, like I said, this is a very early study. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways of, of, of measuring responsiveness. Um, and I want to compare them and understand what the differences are. Um, I, it might turn out to be that certain kinds of methodologies are different. One of the things I'm concerned about for multi-stream responsiveness is how you generate cross-traffic is extremely important. I've already noted that the congestion control algorithm is extremely important. Um, there's a bunch of things there that need to be looked at. There, um, I want to prove that responsiveness predicts uh, web page load time. I actually have a very simple way of doing of doing that. I think uh, without doing a big study, I can actually construct uh, a network where I can control the responsiveness and show that as I adjust the responsiveness. Somebody's got a microphone open. I can show that as I adjust the micro responsiveness, the page load time is predicted by it. Um, there's some other metrics that might be looked at, um, and I'm I'm not going to go into detail there. And one of the things that is actually a problem for our data our uh, well maybe it's a feature our tests only run for typically about 10 seconds it turns out there's a significant number of clients that end with five seconds of queue data after 10 seconds and that five seconds of queue data comes from slow start into an effectively infinite queue i don't get a measurement from these guys other than it's bigger than i measured so um i think that's all i have i Oh, one more. The real problem <laughs> is I want I, I want a responsiveness metric that is exposed. Um, uh, I think part of the reason why we haven't solved the buffer bloat problem and is because it's it's it requires too much knowledge for people to make sense of it, um, and. There's not good lag metrics in most applications. There are some jitter metrics and some video conferencing tools, which are which are great help. Uh, but the thing that will really matter is a consumer uh, grade tool that is available to all sorts of users. Uh, my hope is that we can expose a responsiveness metric side by side with our speed test. Um, we're one of the people who gets could fairly be blamed for the over focus on speed and um, Display. We could display responsiveness. It's only a matter of programming. I think we need to convince ourselves that the metric is right first, but we will do that. Um, and then people can compl complain, and people can see the data, and the engineers can sh see that networks are different. I mean, I showed a bunch of you that the networks are different, and anybody can go run those in their favorite geo. So, any questions? Jones. So we just have a moment for clarifying. Stuart, I see that you're in queue. Is this for a clarifying question? I can wait. Okay. We will keep you in the queue. All right. I think in... Uh, and Ahmed, is this a clarifying or are people queuing for later? I assume um, people For later, it's okay. Okay, great. Um, I see we have a bunch of other stats in here. People want to take quick glances at these. All right. And I think next up we have Brandon. Hey, folks. Uh, next slide. There we go. So I'm going to be talking about today how Facebook understands when network conditions between our edge and end users are the barrier to quality of experience. And we focus, we're trying to measure the path between our edge, shown on the left here, all the components in that path, including things like how the cable modem at the end of the path handles AQM for the uplink um, for different aggregates of users. So the user aggregate on the right here is all ISP users or cable modem users in Redwood City. We break up users by geospatial uh, aspects and also by their connection type and by their provider. Next slide. So, Two examples of QoE metrics. Uh, these are si simple, simplified versions of what we use in production. So for video, for instance, measuring QoE, I wanna make sure that I can play the video stall free. I want it to have acceptable MOS, which means that the quality is good enough that somebody's gonna wanna watch it. And I want it to begin within one second of the request being made by the client. Uh, likewise, I want images to load within 500 milliseconds of a user requesting that image, meaning that the box 
where the image should appear is ready to render the image. Next slide. And the reason we want to know this is we want to be able to characterize our product's requirements. We want to be able to quickly evaluate when changes in network conditions impact QoE. So if a metric changes, does it actually matter? Or is it inconsequential in terms of what our users are going to perceive? And we want to be able to identify actionable improvements at the product network and transport layers. I improve the product, yeah, include the product piece here because we can't always make improvements at the network layer, but we can often make improvements to how our product adapts to those network conditions. Next slide. So I'm going to be talking today about the types of traffic I mentioned a little earlier. I'm not talking about real-time traffic. We use a slightly different set of metrics to understand that type of traffic, like the call I'm on right now. But for this transfer of object type traffic, we measure two things. The first is the propagation delay for each of these aggregates. And the propagation delay is going to tell us the minimum network time for any request, regardless of the response size. So for instance, I can have a user with a one gigabit per second link. But if the propagation delay between them and Facebook Edge is 500 milliseconds, it doesn't matter if they have that 1G link, any image is gonna take 500 milliseconds to load. And that means that 500 millisecond quality of experience metric I said earlier is always going to be violated. Uh, the propagation delay is telling us the link, the propagation time of all the links, things like interleaving in the access network, which can be significant on some access technologies, transmission time, the presence of persistent queues, and we measure it as the median min RTT as measured by our quick stack at the server over uh, connections from each of these aggregates and time windows. So we can see over a day for each of these aggregates, how does this measure of propagation delay change? Next slide. The other thing we look at is what we call the good put success rate. And this is the probability that a connection in one of these aggregates can deliver a stream of bytes at a given rate. Um, again, earlier I brought up if it's 500 milliseconds of propagation delay, we know that's always going to be a component in a transfer. The question then is how quickly after I account for that propagation delay, can the network stream bytes to me in a reliable manner? Uh, this is going to account for congestion control behavior, transport behavior, while shaping at the bottleneck link. If there's contention at the user's uplink, preventing acts from getting back to the server, that's going to appear here as well. Now, when we measure this, we don't want to use speed tests. And that's because we found that speed tests are not representative of our production traffic. Our users are not downloading ISOs, they're not downloading bulk files, they're downloading small objects. Um, and furthermore, we can't just use object transfer times because those are gonna be subject to things such as application behavior. If I change how my application multiplexes traffic, I may change, observe a change in uh, object transfer times. That doesn't mean there's been any change in the underlying network conditions. Likewise, CDN conditions can be incorporated into object transfer times as well as startup behavior and things like propagation delay again. So the way we measure this is again, is at the server side for each of these connections in an aggregate, we're looking at how quickly can the transport deliver bytes when those bytes are available to be sent to the user or to the client. And that becomes our measurement of quick bit. Next slide. So this is a simple example here of propagation delay and good put success rate for 2.5 minutes per second for a users in a cellular network. We can see at the bottom, which shows the relative traffic volume for that time in the day, as the traffic volume increases, the success rate for 2.5 megabits per second decreases. So these users, if the application requires 2.5 megabits per second to provide good QoE, it's going to have a harder time. And often cases, it won't be able to provide it at these peak hours of the day. And through other signals, we determine that this is likely due to cellular RAM congestion. Next slide. So I'm going to very quickly go over these. There is oftentimes very little degradation for aggregates of users. Network traffic is pretty constant over time. We talk about this further in the paper. There's also often not any opportunity to use performance or routing to provide benefits. Talk about that further in the paper, but it suggests that most problems are in the access network or further beyond any BGP routing change can address. Next slide. So I think the final points that are probably most interesting to this group are, are why are we using this good put success rate instead of metrics and propagation delay instead of metrics like SRTT or the loss and retransmission rate? The reality is that loss and retransmission rates are really difficult to interpret in isolation. Um, first, they're going to be functions of congestion control and sender behavior. So, for instance, in some environments, Cubic has a lower retransmission rate than BBR, but Cubic also ends up having lower good put, and it may struggle to, for instance, provide the good put required for applications. Uh, good put success rate more holistically captures how all these underlying network conditions, along with how the congestion control and the transport behave under those conditions, uh, are in, in 
impact our ability to deliver bytes to the users. And then the final thing here is, well, I talked about all these things of how we measure QoS. How do we determine what QoS conditions are required for good QoE? And what that really comes down to is taking those QoE uh, requirements that I described earlier and seeing how a aggregate's ability, how users in the aggregate's ability to achieve those uh, requirements changes as network conditions change. So if I have two aggregates of clients and they have different network conditions that we've observed through these measurements, how do those network conditions as they change impact the client's ability to have good QoE? And with that, happy to take any clarifying questions. All right, any clarifying questions? Uh, um, looks like we have a couple in queue for that. So we have a uh, Robin first. Yeah, I was mainly wondering about uh, the good put measurements. I can't find it immediately in the paper. Um, if, if that is done at, at the actual TCP layer, uh, or TCP implementation or inferred from higher level uh, behavior, let's say HTTP layer. Uh, so we do this at the quick layer now. Uh, we also have a metric that works for TCP, but our quick metric is, is better. What we're looking there is as we push bytes into the network, what's the, how quickly are we able to deliver contiguous sets of bytes because we need reliable delivery for it to be useful for the client to the, to the client. And that's looking at us looking at act timestamps relative to TX timestamps and also accounting for for instance, if a retransmission was required to get a contiguous set of bytes to the user. Yeah, I, I get that it's possible for quick, but it's much more difficult for TCP. That's why I... Uh... TCP has socket timestamps that the kernel can give you on both TX and ACK for Linux. Uh, those ACK timestamps and TX timestamps can be used to do much of the same work. Happy to discuss. Okay, thanks. And Jana also has a clarification question. Sami, thanks, Brandon, for that talk. Uh, two quick questions. One. Have you looked at and considered delivery rate, which is in TCP uh, in the Linux kernel? And you might uh, wondering if you consider an equivalent of that for quick as well, uh, in addition to this medic. And second, um, have, do you compensate in your good put uh, in your good put measurement for application limited periods and application limited behaviors? Yeah, so I'll take the second question first here. We do when we look at the quick stack, we're looking to see when do we come application limited. And then that's a signal that the, you know, there, there is a hole in the network space where we're no longer pushing the network as hard as we could. And that's being incorporated into our measurements. Um, for the first piece here, the delivery rate, the challenge with the delivery rate is it's a measurement of throughput, not of good put, right? Because my congestion control algorithm is using that to understand how quickly, what rate it should be sending at, not then. And so that's not always going to be representative of good put. The other thing is that's measured over a single RTT window. And so it can vary widely. With what we're doing here, we're able to look at, I have a 50 kilobyte or 100 kilobyte object, how long can I expect that object to transfer? And we found that the delivery rate often is a weaker estimator than what we built for that. Happy to discuss further offline. Great, well, thank you to both of our presenters for this first metrics section. And now we're gonna to get to the main queue, which I believe starts with Stuart. I actually have comments from Matt and Brandon, so I'll try to do both in 60 seconds. Um, thank you for talking about uh, round trips per minute, Matt. Some people on the call will have heard of that, but I expect some have not. The idea behind RPM is latency and milliseconds are kind of abstract concepts, especially to the end users that we've been talking about. So we took the reciprocal of that. Uh, so, round, so round trips per second or hertz, and uh, and then we went to round trips per minute. It's nice because it gives a number where more is better. Uh, it's three or four digits typically and has no decimal places. So it's a nice convenient metric and coincidentally it aligns with car RPMs. Uh, I put a link to the video in the chat. Uh, and for Matt's presentation, that means that when the graphs go up and to the right, that's a good thing. That's not latency getting worse, it's responsiveness getting better. Uh, for Brandon's comments about video quality, people uh, often think... measure. We're out of time, so can you re in -queue? Okay, sure. Uh, thank you. All right, uh, next. Torless, you had gotten in and out of queue. Do you want to just go? Um, so I think what kind of trickled through uh, at the sidelines of these presentations was the metric I, as a user, am, am always most interested in, which is the whose fault is it metric, right? So in terms of looking at the numbers saying most likely causes this and that, 
which I think goes back to the ultimate question of actionability of metrics, right? I mean, what, what is it that who wants to get out of the metrics? And I think that would be, I think, good criteria, you know, um, being able to isolate and uh, have actions coming out of it. All right, thank you. Um, and I realized I think I had skipped uh, Ahmed, who's also in the queue. Uh, it was just uh, uh, something Matt said about how different versions of TCP give different performances. And that just sort of goes back to what I was saying earlier about one protocol, one definition, and the implementations uh, kind of like give different performances. And you can see the knock on effect that has on measurements and interpreting those measurements and then acting upon those measurements. Because if two TCP implementations give two different answers like, yeah you have a problem <laughs> which one do you believe <laughs> and, and and this is why i'm saying i think um measuring performance should be part of the protocol design process from, from the start and not an aftermath great uh omar um yeah i have a question to brandon um you mentioned that you were using P50 to uh, to correlate between uh, good put and uh, application performance. I wonder uh, what uh, what have you seen when looking at P90 or 9599 instead of P50? So the reason that we don't want to use these higher percentiles, and arguably we could use the P5 as long as the aggregates that we're creating are sets of homogeneous users, meaning that, again, it's all cable modem users on ISPX and Redwood City. They should all have about the same propagation delay in terms of what we're measuring here. Um, P99 is going to be capturing things like, again, the user's uplink is congested because some other application is sending at that point in time. And that's no longer a measure of the propagation delay between Facebook and that aggregate of end users. That's something specific to that individual end user. It's not as actionable on our side. Furthermore, it's going to appear in our good put metric because that um, queuing on the uplink is going to delay acts. And because we're measuring good put at the server side, it's going to appear in that measurement. So we don't want to measure the same thing twice. We measure propagation delay, which is all these components that we expect, especially since our connections are pretty short, to be relatively stable over a five minute period, for instance. And then we measure good put to see how quickly the network can deliver bytes to our users. So that's why we don't look at the P99.9. It's gonna have somebody's one second delay in there due to somebody cooking a potato in a microwave. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I think next we have Dave and he wanted to look at the graph. I have that here. The one you're for? That one. We had a case for longitudinal me measurements uh, just described several times in several talks. This was one of the most exciting graphs I've seen in a long time, roughly a five fold improvement. In I don't know why the cubic thing got good for a month, um, but roughly a three to five fold improvement in responsiveness across the internet in the last five years. Um, so, my question for the other presenters. Uh, are you keeping longitudinal measurements and are you seeing any kind of trend lines along these ways? No, do we want to, is that a question to use that other presenter? Is that the, other, the other two, the, Brandon, for example, of Facebook, um, do you have measurements over time of some of your core metrics? Yeah, are. we we keep we keep metrics over time, both to look at how interventions impact yeah. the network conditions and ultimately impact QoE. Um, I think one of the most recent changes that we've had in the past year that we've talked publicly about is switching from TCP to QUIC, and that you know again we're looking at um, how does that impact the good put that we can achieve, and how does it impact propagation delay? Propagation delay, as expected, doesn't change because of how we're measuring it, but it does impact good put because the transport becomes more efficient at dealing with loss cases when we're using quick. Yeah. So if I may have 10 seconds more, tossing out the 98th, 99th percentile, the user's experience when something goes to hell for a second is often rather emotional. And trying to find ways of eliminating those anomalies from the experience is kind of important. We, we would capture that in the good put metric in that it took longer to transfer objects to that user for that second when things went to the top, but agreed. All right, thank you. 
Um, Stuart, you had re -enqueued. Uh Thank you. Uh, so this comment is to Brandon, uh, uh, not, not a criticism, just an observation. Uh, when you talk about the video quality, uh, you talk about the normal things that people do, um, MOS, mean opinion school and rebuffering events and things like that for watching a continuous video from start to end. The other thing that we're looking at is random access because people don't always sit down and watch a video from start to end in a two hour sitting. Uh, they might skip ahead 30 seconds. They might skip to another chapter. If they're watching YouTube, they might click on a different video. So that's another area where we'd really like to improve responsiveness. So your streaming video works as well as a local DVD. Yeah, I, I think the uh, uh, actually uh, unclear. Yeah, uh, Brandon, I guess going forward, it'd be good to have uh, the speakers kind of enqueue themselves as well. That's fine. Yeah, I'm happy to wait all on on queue. Or and also feel free to use the Slack. Um, Vidi next. Hi, uh, my question is to Brandon about the uh, measurements. And if I understand correctly, you mentioned that it is doing measurements on the server, but I think what's also important is measurement on the client because uh, sure you have a good delivery rate, but what's the guarantee that the client has seen that data or the application layer has delivered that data to the client and, you know, <laughs> because that's what matters. It doesn't matter what server is delivering, I think. So, uh i think both client and server are important um and and the second thing i wanted to say was uh it's kind of related to uh, my first point is uh, not just the transport layer metrics but the application layer metrics are also you know important so yeah that's that's all i want to say thank you lucas Hello. Um, it's, it's kind of a slightly a clarifying question, but it was too much to do at the talk about the request per minute and the responsiveness, which I think is 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 much better than bandwidth. Um, let's just be clear, like the whole theme of today. But like how how that would map to web page loading, given how incredibly complicated um, the whole process of being a browser and rendering pages is, and you know how moving resources around slightly or changing a server software to 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 maybe serve things in a slightly different order or loading a, an, an ad from a third party network on that page on a different tcp connection entirely competes with um, the things trying to to come from the first party like i just wondered how um that that whole mapping was done um and if there's a if there's a methodology that could be shared really or is this a um it worked for a specific type of web page, um, which is still fine. Uh, but um, yeah, just just trying to understand how that might be more applicable to people. Right. Thank you, and we'll get to Matt to answer a little bit later. Uh, Jana, hi. Um, I want to quickly go back to uh, Matt's uh, thing. It probably speaks to what Lucas said just a little bit. Uh, Matt's graph about showing the longitudinal one that Dave was talking about just now, it seems to suggest that Reno was actually the most responsive of Reno, Quebec, and BBR. Um, now, he, that actually is included to me in certain ways, but I want to note here that it's important for us to not just think about responsiveness as the better metric, but as an additional metric that fills the spectrum of metrics that we need. We want to measure latency, we want to measure bandwidth. Those are super useful and important. And responsiveness is perhaps something that is additional. It, it offers a third axis, so to speak, uh, that we also need to measure. So uh, I would say that bandwidth is, 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 is let's, not, let's not throw the baby out of the bathwater, so to speak. Let's not discard bandwidth. It is important and useful. It's not adequate, uh, is, is what I would like to suggest. But I would also like to hear from Matt about uh, what he thinks about the responsiveness of uh reno versus bbr thanks all right um brandon is back up next so oh, two things here i think one was a question around measuring from the server side is that we're going to be representative of what the client experiences uh the client stack that we have for instance on an android application we write the quick transport layer it's our own implementation it's open source called move fast we write the application that sits on top of it 
And because it's quick and not TCP, we can be assured that acts that we're seeing are not coming from, for instance, a PEP, a performance enhancing proxy between us and the user, and thus are representative of when the app, when the traffic arrives at the client and when it's going to go up to the application. Um, and we've compared internally our timestamps and they're, you know, the measurements from both sides are strongly correlated. Uh, the other piece here was random access. Completely agree. I think we have some of that in looking at when a user clicks on a new video, how long is it going to take for that video to start playing? Facebook is a little bit different than Netflix or other content providers in that our videos are typically short. So random access may not apply as much. You're not shipping, uh, skipping forward trap chapters, but still a good thing to consider. Thanks. All right. Thank you. And uh, Matt, did you want to? Yeah, I can answer. So it sounds like a plus. Okay. Yeah. So um, the I, there's a thought experiment I imagine I'm doing, which shows why responsiveness predicts web web browsing. And that is you imagine, I, I'm going to have troubles doing this in a minute, but uh, I, I, there's a network device I imagined called, I call a rounds gate, which is a queuing discipline that consists of an input queue and an output queue. And the output queue drains on a, sort of the normal back pressure driven by the device. And the input queue gathers packets coming from the application. And then you have a clock that atomically moves one queue to the, to the other. And this, what this forces is that the round trip time is exactly equal to the clock tick rate. So I can set it to one second. I can set it to 100 milliseconds, whatever. And if I run a browser on it, and the browser doesn't ever see any congestion signals, the elapsed time for the browser to finish will depend on the number of clicks I go through the rounds gate. So I can count round trips in the network. And if it's always slow start and always cascaded loads caused by HTML invoking other other embedded objects, it ought to be a fixed number. Oh, DNS also goes in there, DN, fixed number of rounds. Um, some of them are application layer rounds and some of them are, are network layer rounds, but I can just count the round number of rounds in the web page. And RPM is going to predict how long it's going to take to load to the first approximation. And that's, you know, I want to write this up, but yep, that's good. It's pretty obvious <laughs> once you see it. Thank you. All right, uh, Stuart, responding to Lucas. Uh, yes, Lucas, you asked a question which Matt just covered on, but I want to expand on that. Why does round trip matter for web page loading? Um, uh, th there's a sequence of round trips. DNS is a round trip. You wait for the reply before you can make the connection. Then typically today, a round trip for TCP, a round trip for TLS. Then you've got to get index.html. First thing it refers to is a style sheet. So now you're going to do another get for the style sheet or an image. If that's on a different page, it's another DNS. These round trips add up a lot. And if you've got hundreds of megabits, loading an ad from another web server makes absolutely no difference because you're not maxing out the capacity. So it is. it comes down in today's world for most people. It's all about the number of round trips. The assumption that loading an advert will make a difference is based in this assumption of scarcity. If bandwidth is scarce, how you allocate it matters. If bandwidth is ridiculously abundant, it ceases to matter, and it's just round trip time that matters. All right, thank you. Um, I had enqueued myself. Uh, I have more of just kind of a, a meta question for us as we have these two different topics we are going through. Um, I wanted to hear from people, you know, we have on one hand, the concept of RPM and responsiveness. And then from Brandon's talk, we have the propagation delay. Um, you know, to what degree are these different things? Are they the same thing? Are they converging on kind of this axis that we're looking at? And um, is one way of framing it uh, preferable to the other in the eyes of this group? So that's just a question. Um, next up, we have Jana. Um, this might part, be partly in response to the question that you just asked. Um, I, I want to, again, uh, yes, it's absolutely important and critical, and, and people have heard me say this in the past as well. Round trip times are critical. Light of speed isn't going anywhere. We And, and web pages tend to end in 80% of, of uh, page loads, typically at servers, tend to be, uh, tend to end in slow start. So we know that uh, uh, that web pages are are not saturating the network, so bandwidth isn't uh, a problem. However, it is important not to walk away from bandwidth. We want to add 
um, bandwidth is still useful and still important. There are plenty of situations under which you are still bandwidth limited. Consider, uh, uh, you know, when I travel, for example, in India, I do often find that the page that I'm getting, Google automatically sends me off to the the low quality page loads because my my bandwidth and round of time are measured to be uh, uh, low. Now, this happens and this is real and it's important to consider that uh, uh, those th that's important as well. So all I want to say is, I don't think one is better than the other. I think we need both. So to Brandon's uh, measurement and to uh, the RPM metric, I think we need to have all of them. They don't replace each other. Uh, next up, Bjorn. Yeah, hey guys. Um, just to uh, uh, point there about the round trips, I think it, that's uh, a very good um, description of how uh, the se the sequence of uh, of steps makes the round trip very important. And then um, I also want to just point out that it's very it's it's important to to keep um, more than just an average, for instance, of that round trip time because. Uh, if you have rare events that show up once in a while on one of those uh, round trips, then because they all line up in a in a in a uh, change, then that will affect the outcome of the uh, load time, right? So um, any metric that wants to capture that effect needs to either do the entire sequence, as I think is is if I understand correctly, that's what you're doing with the um rpm or to um keep some sort of t statistical distribution of those uh, round trip times all right thank you brandon i think in terms of comparing the two metrics i i need actually a little bit more understanding from from matt to completely understand the other metric that i'm looking at but also how uh ndt works but in terms of responsiveness if you think of it as propagation delay is going to be the best case responsiveness that I can have. If I have a user connected via a satellite connection, it's 500 milliseconds propagation delay. It doesn't matter what size of response I send, it's always going to be at least 500 milliseconds till they see that response. And then when we're measuring good put in, in the metric that we have here, we're looking to see, okay, if it's object size X, what's the likelihood I'm going to be able to transfer it to the user in time Y? And that's going to, you know, it, I need at least one propagation delay, at least one RTT to get that response. And then the good put is going to tell me, with some probability how likely it is to arrive by time X. And that can allow me to understand how likely is a user going to be waiting time, you know, some amount of time for this response to arrive, dependent on that response's size. Um, but I do, I do think they are measuring slightly different things. I think that they're both relevant. Um, I think the looking at SRTT, as I mentioned, is just difficult to understand when that increases, is it increasing just because the transport is pushing the congest the, the connection and probing for bandwidth? Or and you know, what, what does that ultimately mean for user experience? All right, thank you. Dave. To be somewhat deliberately contrarian, this conversation is taking place over a video conference. And in that case, one-way delays in both directions are very important and coming up with additional metrics on top of what we have and along Janus lines for covering jitter and other flaws in the user experience of video conferencing is very important and I wish we could all work together towards improving video conferencing behaviors as well. All right, uh, Torlis. Yeah, so I do like the uh, the uh, marketing benefits of RPM, so that's, that's really cool. Um, I, I, I like the original vision of the internet, right, that I can go to places all over the world and um, Obviously, the further I go, uh, the harder it gets. And so I think that's not, you know, represented in that metric yet. Obviously, the absolute experience kind of is, is, is ideal when I have a local cache. I can't do that for all type of services. So somehow the distance and, you know, the mileage, <laughs> the miles that you had to travel should be taken in so that, you know, also uh, things that are far away but really have a good path, um, you know, are highlighted to the user. Thank you. I don't see anyone else in queue right now. You have some comments. If you'd like to say your comments, 
out loud, feel free to enqueue yourself. Would you like me to say a few words about the RPM tool? Go for it. I think we have time, right? We still have 20 minutes on the... 20 minutes. No one's in queue. All right, then. Um, yes, there's, there's, it seems like there's some interest in this. There's, there's been various people asking questions around this subject. So I can talk a little bit about what the RPM tool does. Bear in mind, this is still in development and it will evolve. Part of the point of this workshop is we want to get feedback from other people about ways we could improve that. Uh, but I'll tell you where we are now. Uh, for start, we don't measure round trip time with ping because we want to measure real world effects. And we talked earlier about gaming. When you measure round trip time with ICMP echo request, it motivates network vendors to prioritize ICMP echo request, which doesn't help anything else unless you run all your traffic over ICMP echo request. So we measure it using actual HTTP2 ping frames in the same HTTP stream, uh, because that's what matters. When you're loading a web page, you're doing a get and getting the response. So we want to measure the in-connection round trip time. The other thing we want to measure is uh, not the round trip time when the network is idle, uh, but when it's busy. And by busy, I don't mean Friday evening peak Netflix viewing hours, uh, because if I take one photograph with my iPhone and text it to you with Apple messages, that ought to saturate my uplink because that's the job of a transport protocol to send that photograph, that eight, nine megabyte high quality photograph. It should send it as fast as the network will carry, which means one user with one phone with one photograph should be saturating the network. And if they're not, file a bug report. When I'm doing that, the video conference should not go to hell. So in the RPM test, we saturate the uplink in both directions, up and down. We, we send TCP data until it gets out of slow start and experiences one or more losses. When we believe we have pushed the buffers to overflow, we start measuring the in-stream HTTP ping frame round trip time, because that is a measure of if I skip ahead in a video and suddenly my video client says, no, don't get that, get this instead. What is the minimum time that that new get request can deliver the new video data to me that I now want to be watching? So that's a bit of background. It will change over time. We hope it will, and we hope we get good feedback how to improve it. And we hope that other uh, parts of the community will also put similar tests into their products too. Thank you. Um, that has given us good background and also time to rebuild our queue. Uh, Wes, go for it. So I was actually just in the queue to seed the queue with a new question. So I think since there is a queue, I will do it later if we run out again. Okay, great. Jonna. It's Tommy. Um, thank you for that explanation, Stuart. I had one, um, I don't know if it, it's a question, not a comment. It's, it's a question really. And if it's not a question, then it's a comment. Um, basically what would be really useful is to be able to measure the responsiveness of the network, not when you are doing the measurement, but when I'm doing an activity. So, for example, if I'm watching Netflix, it would be good for me to be able to use the tool to measure how responsive my network is. So perhaps I can predict how fast I can scrub the video, so to speak, as you we were talking about. You know, how you know is it reasonable for me to scrub through the video? And if I'm scrubbing through the video, if I can't, if I'm not able to do it well, well, I can run this tool and go, well, that's because my network is not responsive. But that that the, I'm trying to separate the responsiveness tool from 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 the measurement that you have you are doing, but I think there's value in being able to do that uh, separately as well. So I, what do you think Netflix. about that? Is that done? We'd, yeah, we'd love to work with Netflix or anybody else. They want to build this tool into their smart TVs. I think that would be really useful for Netflix to be able to give you some predictor about how responsive the client will be on your network. All right. Um... Should I go back in queue, Tommy? Because I wanted to clarify that. Can, can you jump at the back of the queue? Yes, I can. Sorry. Uh, Brandon. Yeah, I, I might have misunderstood, but it sounded like the RPM tool was driving the bottleneck at the, and during the connection, it would be saturated and then building up a queue there. And then you're looking to see what's the responsiveness given that queue. Um, I guess one challenge there is that might not be representative of what traffic looks like, even for video traffic for Facebook. 
if we're not pipelining, it means that we're always going to have one request in flight at any point in time. Our, re our frames are uh, chunk sizes are on the order of two seconds. So that means at most I can have two seconds worth of data sitting in that queue. And given connection speeds, I don't expect a survey to see that queue extend to its full length like it would during a speed test or a, a ISO download. Um, also, given that you're using, we're using in this case BBR, we expect that to be trying to manage the queue and to prevent it from growing significantly. Um, so I guess I'm curious if if it's going to be representative, it seems like more of like a worst case scenario in what you're describing, which which is itself useful to measure, but it might not be representative of what the typical user experiences. All right. I quickly respond to that. Can you get in queue? I'll make it very brief. Can, oh, you, can you get in sure, queue? I will. Nope. Thank you. Lucas. Um, it's interesting about the pings. Um, HG pings uh, avenue for DOS attack, and I know that there's implementations that do mitigate those things. So if you have some like frequency or ping rate in mind, um, soliciting that as a use case could help. Um, and the reason I say that is because, for example, gRPC uses ping as a way to gauge BDP and, and to try and do some clever auto tuning stuff. And their algorithm is very aggressive, um, possibly too over aggressive. I don't know. Uh, but we we've seen that um, result in the connection getting closed. So uh, I think it's probably a, a solvable issue, but definitely something the community might be interested in. Um, cheers. All right, Mikhail. Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, thank you, Stuart, for your description uh, of the metric. Uh, however, I have a, another maybe comment or question. Uh, do you think that um, maybe it would be fruitful to uh, to measure uh, or to, to not to measure but to load the network from, for example, from another device? Because uh, we often have uh, like shared link, which is shared in some way, and if you uh, load the link from your device, as you as you said, as, as far as I understand, you say that you send, uh, for example, data from your device and then measure the link state from the same, the same device. Uh, for example, uh, in real life, I think we would have the situation when there, there is our neighbor, or, or not our neighbor, but our, uh, I don't know, mom, uh, mom or, uh, or son who is watching some YouTube and it's like a shared channel. You have uh, different, um, you have some kind of uh, scheduling, for example, in the network devices, which share the resource between you and somebody else. And that's more like close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Jana. Sorry. So I wanted to clarify something that I said earlier. Um, basically, the tool or the measurement right now is uh, and this is specific to the tool Stuart, so after this, I will take it offline and we can talk about it separately. It seems that the tool basically measures uh, the network network conditions under load that is created by the tool. That is useful, but it describes a stat describes the network as a static thing, which could have the wor have a worst case potentially RPM of whatever it ends up being. Now, bear in mind that the RPM is here uh, uh, still a function of the congestion controller that's used by the sender because the sender uses a buffer filling congestion controller versus a buffer not filling congestion controller, your response is going to be different. What I wanted to see here was a tool or what I was suggesting was a tool that could measure my network as it is right now without loading it, assuming that I'm loading it with other stuff. So if I'm watching doing WebEx right now, my network is in a certain place and it would be useful for me to be able to run a tool that simply does pings and back to some known server just to measure the responsiveness of my local network. Um, so I understand completely that it's a limited tool, but I think it's still it, it still will be very useful if I don't have the load the network right now while I'm already doing WebEx. I don't want to do that, but I'd like to measure the responsiveness of my network. So thank you, thank you, Roberto. Um, so I think any such tools are always useful and interesting. The thing that I'm worried about, though, is that, you know, as I'm looking across everything that we're talking about, we, we haven't mentioned CDNs once and, you know, whether or not you get a cache hit and things like that very much drastically change the application experience. Again, I, I, 
the reason I'm bringing it up in the context of a tool is is because right now this is something that is problematic from a tooling perspective across wider applications for figuring out how you are doing better or worse. Um, we have not any real standards for how to measure performance in the presence of CDNs when there's cache hits, not cache hits. Um, and this will continue to be especially problematic um, so long as we have L7 proxies that do reordering or, or, uh, or dealing with packet loss um, as part of their proxy. Because right now, deploying an L7 is an engineering decision with trade-offs as opposed to an L4 where I'm just packet switching. So a little bit of a mix up. Uh, I just want to throw it out there that, you know, we really haven't touched on this and it's a huge deal. Thank you. Um, back to Stuart. All right, I've got three to answer. Let's make this quick. Uh, Brandon talked about Facebook only fetching two second chunks of video, which is great. That limits the amount of damage Facebook can do to other traffic, but it doesn't limit the amount of damage other traffic can do to Facebook's video experience. Um, Mikhail talked about measuring from a different device. Uh, that would be a useful thing to expand in the future. Right now, our assumption for most users is they have a dumb FIFO queue and it fills to capacity and it really doesn't matter whether it's uh, two apps on the same device, two people in the house using different devices. The FIFO queue has a certain size and it gets filled with whatever packets are put in it. Uh, to Jana's point, measuring the network as it is right now and he doesn't want to load it while doing WebEx. Well, if one of your family members sends an email with a large attachment, they'll load the network and there's nothing you can do about it. So uh, that's the scenario we want to replicate with this tool is the stuff that actually does happen every day to normal users that makes their WebEx go to hell when someone else loads the network. Uh, I can load the network because I'm running FQCODL here and I can do it and it doesn't affect the WebEx. We want everybody to have that experience. Thank you. Uh, Cohen. Yeah, I um, <clears throat> wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, th that low latency is actually a collaboration between both the network and the, the the users of the network, let's say the applications. Um, so so I see a lot and, and I kind of, re it relates a little bit to what Stuart said, it's um, applications can, can, can use the network, but can also cause the latency. Um, so, so a lot of discussions have been about how applications can measure how well the network works, but um, what, what's important is that the network gives the right signals to, to the applications when the latency is exceeded or what's their goal of, of having a queue for that specific uh, technology. Um, so, so it's also important maybe that networks can, can also measure how well applications uh, respond to their signals, for instance. Um, so, so that's another angle because because of the two parties, it's not only the applications that should measure the network. It might also be interesting to see that the, the network can measure the different applications and how well they respond to their signals if they're right. helping. Thank you. Thank you, Khan. Uh, Matt. So I, I want to sort of raise a side point that was missed, I think, earlier in this framing the question. But knowing where the endpoints are is a sort of a sub problem, which the users can't solve very well, but the content providers understand and know about things like CDNs and such. Um, this is why my vision, it actually goes back to the Web 100 proposal was always on instrumentation in every content provider. And um, the content providers do measurements, the contact providers, content providers know which ISPs have problems, where they know where they need more peering. Um, and that's the strong way to solve it. As outsiders, we tend to focus on the client side measurements, but, but those can only know half the story. And, and that's sort of intrinsic. Thank you. Uh, Jared. I was just going to comment a few things real quick. Uh, yes, CDNs have lots of measurements, just like the prior commenter said. Our customers actually have even more measurements of their multi-CDN environment because most customers are multi-CDN. And so they're gonna say, 
oh, today Akamai is great, Fastly is bad, or uh, Fastly and Cloudflare are totally crushing Akamai, um, et cetera. And so we're not going to give Akamai any traffic. Um, you know, so, you know, whatever that case is, and that may be, and, and they can be hyper localized in what they do. There's already a lots of companies that do this professional measurement as a service. Uh, and we, we probably should have done a better job of recruiting some of them in here uh, to participate in this, uh, uh, you know, with my IAB hat on is like, I, I just didn't, you know, I didn't think of that until just now. Um, the other thing is, you know, as a, you know, I have a small fiber to the home ISP. Um, the client device behavior is super interesting. I had issues with my kids uh, downloading okay. Steam games uh, because they you know, they could plug into the Ethernet and pull at a gig, uh, which impacted my WebEx experience uh, with them downloading a 800 megs or whatever based on the design of my home network. It was easier for me to just upgrade my home network to 10 gig to solve that problem. Time. Sorry. And, Sorry. Uh, and client and client <laughs> uh, when. When Amazon video starts on my Al, computer, Al is up. something Al is up. It pulls 150 megabits a second. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tommy. I couldn't let the whole day go by without saying something. And uh, uh, so it's going to come down to the expression of the RPM results to users. I heard Brandon a couple of times say that uh, the propagation delay is the thing that's going to set the sort of the minimum performance. Uh, but also Jana's point that uh, we're not going to set aside uh, the other metrics that we uh, uh, know and love, like a capacity metric and, and so forth. So these these set the these set the upper kind of the upper and lower bars for uh, for the, the performance that uh, could be plotted or expressed on an RPM tachometer graph. I even envisioned that uh, later on. So in a couple of days from now, uh, we can touch on this again. the The key point is to have a frame of reference uh, that everybody can understand. Uh, when you when you plot the data for a user, thanks. All right, thank you. And then I had enqueued myself. Um, I just wanted to point out something I was observing um, around what Michaela brought up around you know, kind of which device is generating the load and how that happens. Um, you know, Stuart rightly pointed out that you know most of the routers today their queue won't really be affected too much by that. Um, but going back to one of the points that we were talking about in the first uh, half of this day about kind of the game theory and how you want to game these metrics. Um, if we were trying to have RPM or something like it be kind of a gaming proof metric or something that has aligned incentives, we also want to make sure that that metric is not only based on you generating the load yourself, because it is possible to build a router then that games it such that you say, oh, you know, this device is generating load but the other ones aren't, and therefore I'll treat it differently than the others. Um, so we, we may want to think about that in kind of our overall gaming and have versions of the metric that can generate load from multiple devices. And I'm done. I was about to say time, just to make sure somebody did it for you. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you very much, Tommy, for running the last two hours of, of queuing and sessions, appreciate it greatly. Um, I think, you know, today went really well. I'm, I'm happy to see all of the discussion that's happened or, or leaving room for lots of discussion has definitely uh, fired some people up, which is a good thing. Uh, a couple of quick closing comments for the day. One, uh, we're going to be back here tomorrow, uh, starting at the same time as we did, did this morning, evening, or whatever time it is for you. Um, one quick comment. A lot of people have pointed out that the camera-ready copies of the papers on the website are, are not the most recent ones. Uh, we apologize, as we said, we we threw this you know together quickly due to the compressed time schedule, and we don't have direct control over the website, so we have to give changes to somebody else to actually make them happen. So there's a little bit of a delay there, but we will try and make sure that we get uh, all of them updated uh, shortly. Uh, thank you for everybody that contributed to today's discussions and presentations and verbal discussions and discussions on the Slack channel, which has uh, taken off as well. Appreciate it greatly. Um, and as a reminder, I will close the recording uh, momentarily, and you are welcome to stay around and hang out in the WebEx room and chat in a more freeform session without any moderators and timekeepers. So you're all on your own. Uh, this is sort of our attempt uh, to, to deal with uh, the fact that we are not meeting physically and there's no hallway conversations and no you know running off to coffee shops or other forms of beverage al allocations and uh, to have discussions so feel free to step uh, stick around or uh, even leave and come back 
uh, myself, I'm probably going to go make lunch because I only have an hour between a bunch of other meetings. But that brings us to the end of the day. And I look forward to talking to you all tomorrow and hearing the next set of presentations, which will be continuing this theme of sort of the metrics side of things. And metrics. Too. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, Wes, and all the moderators for running this. And Wes, I love the fact that you have a picture of green cloth as your virtual WebEx background. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is my Zoom cloth. Oh, Zoom. It's, a, it's, a lit, it's a literal green screen. I mean, what else could you ask for? My guitar uh, is back there. That Jared, would be to look at. <laughs> Jared, I would love to talk to you about your hypothetical customer who said Akamai was good, but Fastly was bad. Uh, oh, the customer doesn't exist, but talk to me offline if you want to talk. Uh, yeah. Hey, Wes, can you turn the breakout rooms here? Uh, I don't think WebEx has breakout rooms. Let me stop the recording yes. before. <laughs>